So I don't have to. Melanie. Melanie. This is Greg. Greg. Melanie. Hi. Melanie. Are you the one painting? Or? No, I'm the one painting. Okay. But um, and you've talked to my wife probably, Krista. She's the yeah. one that's interacting with you. So I'm Jeff. I'm okay. the one. Okay. You can come through here if you'd like. Be careful. Thanks Sure, sure. The bathroom is right around the left. Right there, you'll see it. Meet it. You know, right when you go around that corner there. Okay. So uh, you can say hi. You're live. Oh, hey. All right, you guys. I'm going to be starting here momentarily, and tonight actually I decided I would do a painting instead of a drawing. Um, I'm just going to mix it up each week. Sometimes there'll be drawings, sometimes there'll be paintings. Um, yeah, we're just going to have a lot of fun on these on these live streams. So uh, the model just got here. She's going to be getting set up here in a moment. Um, again, unfortunately, we're not going to be doing a lot of you know uh, reference shots yet. We may down the road when we do portraits and things of that, but. Um, we just have to be careful with all the stuff, you know, uh, nowadays with, with the internet and everything, you've got to be a little bit more privy to that kind of stuff. So we'll be filming. It should be decent quality. Obviously, um, in the online program, we have uh, uh, three cameras, uh, one on the palette, one on right over my head, which is a little bit better angle. And, uh, and then we have uh, one that is a, a secondary camera that's over my shoulder, like the one we're using right now. So uh, we're just going to be using the over the shoulder. So it'll be at a slight angle, but it shouldn't be too big of a problem for you guys. So uh, we'll be getting ready and uh, getting ready to go. So I hope you enjoy. And I'll be talking a lot and stuff. You can ask questions as usual. But this should be a, we'll start having some of the other teachers come in as well on these uh, Friday night streams once we get them kind of up and running. Uh, Eric will be coming in, Lucas, Ben, um, Meadow. Uh, so yeah, we'll, you'll get to watch all of us do different uh, activities from still life to portrait to figure to um, drawing painting you name it so it should be really good for you guys I hope you you know really uh, enjoy it so That's let me cool just tell knife this little one yeah yeah, yeah it's, it, it, these are you can show them on the screen yeah so you guys I'll be using like you know these I, I'm a big palette knife guy so you can see a couple of them that I'll be using probably not extensively it's a female model so I won't be getting too crazy I've got combinations of both filberts, uh, flats, rounds, brights, uh, both bristles and sables. I like to use combinations of soft brushes. This is a nice uh, old lane nickel. It's actually their um, new synthetic. They're actually quite nice. Um, the old lane nickels I prefer, but they, they don't make them anymore, which are the, um, you know, the mongoose hair, or I think it is, or I'm not quite sure what hair they use, but um, these are the, the real haired sables. And then you got your bristles, which are more the um, Signets, the uh, Robert Simmons, which are very reasonably priced and incredibly durable. So these are my favorite uh, bristles I use. But I'm always trying different brushes, always trying different things. So uh, I'll be shuffling around here a little bit, you guys. Just be patient, and I will be ready to uh, go here very soon. So just one second. Let's see. So you just kind of come through here, probably be the easiest. Just two, yeah. Oh yeah, there's two different, yeah, either way. Watch this cord here. So basically, um, I'll just have you up here, and you'll just probably take, um, so we'll have it going this way, and then I'll just have you look over your shoulder, and pick some, some station point over here, and then I'll, I'll go from there. There's some growth closures still. Oh, I know, with all the fires. Okay. 
Well, I'm glad you're here and thanks for coming. Yeah, I don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, it'll be good. You happy where the light is? Yeah, let me, let me, maybe you can stand up there and I'll, I'll take a look here. So yeah, let's, it's just going to be neck up, so no worries, you're great, but it's, yeah, it's going to be mostly just the neck and, okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, you just, yeah, pick the that's perfect. That's totally perfect. Yeah, I think we're good. <clears throat> so we'll do it, okay, so let me get the timer ready. Oh, great, can you grab it? Yep. It's right on the box behind yep. you. Yep, yep. And just, um, can we do 25s, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Or 30s, fine. Yeah, yeah, we'll do, let's do um, 25. You do the timer you want yeah, yeah, I'll just set it here, it'll be easier. Um, let me clear this one. Where's my little, there it is. This is one of those ones that takes. Okay. Okay, so we're set for 25. Okay, so everybody out there, we're going to be doing 25 minutes. So um, at break time, I'll break for about five minutes. And you guys can stretch and kind of, um, you know, meander around, whatever, or, or stay tuned. But I'm going to be getting up. There might be some noise. We have a, another workshop going next door, which is drawing workshop, our Friday night drawing workshop at the Atelier. Um, I just want to make sure so I can scroll down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you go fight. You guys can send questions through if you want um, as I get rolling here. Um, all righty. So first thing I got is I've got an uncontrolled palette. You can't see it, but it's got about 30 colors out. You don't need that. Um, yeah, I'll zoom down to it really Yeah, quick. you can. we're going to do a zoom down here just so you can see. And you can see it's quite out of control. So what, what it's called is a, it's a level 4 palette, which is an uncontrolled palette, which means a warm and cool palette is embedded in this palette. And that's your warm, cool blue, warm, cool yellow, warm, cool red. And then we have our supplemental colors, which are just colors that I find useful. And that's going to differ greatly from individual to individual. So you don't need to chase someone's palette. You need to just understand how to mix properly using uh, different palettes. And then ultimately, you can create your own version that's to your liking. Um, in the online school, we use monochromatic palettes first. And I would highly recommend that for you guys out there, um, which is Burn Umber and White, uh, Thalo Blue, Black and White, um, could be any number of, of, of you know, black, just straight black and white. There's any number of uh, monochrome palettes you can set up. Then we go to the Zorn palette, which is a level four palette, or I mean, excuse me, a level two palette. And that's the um, four color Zorn palette. And that's a red, a yellow, a black, and a white. And then we go to the warm cool palette after that. And that, again, is a warm and cool of all your primaries, white and black. And so you got about seven colors or so in that palette. And now we're going into our uncontrolled palette, which means we're opening the range of the palette even further. You may very well find that warm and cool would suffice for most people for their own. You could mix most tubed colors with the exception of quinacridones and dye colors, um, which you know are fugitive anyway. So we don't really want to get used to using a ton of those. But we, I still use them. And so color mixing, painting in general is, is just, it's a wild deal. I mean, it's... It's really um, so individual, so unique to, 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 to the individual that you're going to hear so many different opinions. And, and ultimately, you want to start very controlled, like I said, with a control palette and work your way up into a more, these more random kind of fun palettes, but palettes that will really challenge you on all kinds of different levels. So our model, um, really beautiful type, um, really full features. Um, Asian with kind of a nice twist, just really neat type. So what you know, you'll see it as it starts evolving. Right now, I'm going to use a small, round bristle that's kind of filed down. Most people would have probably thrown this brush away long ago, but it's great for drawing. I found so I keep them, and I use these as my drawing brushes. So right now, I'm just kind of getting setting up my large scaffolding. And I'm going to be scrubbing and moving shapes around and all kinds of stuff here as we get going. Greg, can you um, find a, a, maybe see if you can find a timer that's better than the one I've got? I don't know, that one's counting already backwards or upwards or I'm not sure what it's going Okay. Yeah, because I don't know what that thing's doing. It says seven. You can use your phone. Yeah, it's almost out of batteries though, unfortunately. Um, so, okay, so yeah, so I'm just gonna kind of tool around here. I'm talking to one of the guys that's helped me out a little bit here. I'm kind of trying to find a timer that's not completely out of you know, control here. All right, so at this stage, I'm just warming my hand up. 
And I'm thinking about the abstraction, and a lot of you aren't going to know maybe what that term is. The abstraction is a rhythmical grid system that was taught at the, originally at the school I went to, the California Art Institute, which is, was uh, Fred, Fred Fixler's school. And I learned from a number of great, great artists, Glenn Orbick, uh, Andrew Bird Hoy, Mark Westmo, just a whole slew of them that were around. Morgan Wessling was there right before me. Um, he taught a little bit, but not much. But he was awesome as well, uh, influence on me. So I'm going to kind of go in right now, and I'm just, again, using very light scaffolding to start my painting here. I'm sitting down below the model looking up at her, which means my, you know, it's going to be an interesting vantage point. I'm hitting the little nodes here for the outside of the lips. How many minutes are on the I'll use my phone for this first one now. Uh, let's just put 20. Okay. okay. So I'm coming around the chin, and I've got, she's got these really, really, really full lips. So I'm going to kind of start to sketch those in. Now I just want a basic general feel for where they're at, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go and flush them out and kind of start getting the particulars. But, Again, we want to think about, at this stage, it's navigation, and we're using line to contain where the form goes. So, you know, although, I, you know, tone, to, painting is tonal, it doesn't mean that line's not used to some degree. And it's used primarily for containing where things go. Okay, there's a cast shadow hitting off the lower lip into some of the musculature and the chin. Again, I'm just trying to set this thing up as nice as possible. There's a little down tilt coming off the eyebrow, so you can see all the axes should be parallel. Once you find that main one that sets the tone, and that usually is going to be across the eye line, not the highest, you know, part, but just generally along the, you know, that 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 part of the brow. She's got really high arcing eyebrows as well, so I have to kind of keep an eye on that. No pun intended. Okay, so parallel. So the nose comes down and I have to estimate this sweep of the nose. I also have to estimate the width of the nostrils. Now if I do this angle correct and this width correct, I can follow parallel to this decision. Parallel means same angle, right? So I'm gonna run parallel and find my tear duct. Now she has an outside gaze as well. So a slight tilt to the head with a gaze, makes for a beautiful portrait, but always makes the eye look like one's too close and one's too far out. So you have to really be on your, on your A game in order to not get the eye to, to look odd. Now there's a cast shadow of the lid because we have above lighting. We usually use above lighting. We're not in a north light situation unless it's dark out, so it wouldn't matter anyway. I'd have to use some kind of artificial lighting in a scenario like this. I kind of grew up using artificial lighting, so I never had the luxury of really enjoying the North Light type scenario that a lot of people swear by, but it really is a luxury. And it's very easy if you have it to say everyone should work from it, but it's very difficult to find a North Light studio sometimes. So I've found over the years that, you know, it's not a deal breaker. It's just um, the light's a lot more steady and cooler and steadier from that North Light type scenario than what we'll be using, which is from an incandescent type bulb which means that the painting's gonna have a little more, more warmth to it. Okay, so I'm setting up that scaffolding. And for a lot of you, I know, you know, yes, of course it would be ideal to have the, the photo handy and this and that. Like I said, we may work towards that in the future, but right now, um, you know, we're just gonna do it this way and it should still be incredibly informative and, and uh, inspirational to you, I would, I would hope. I mean, that's my goal. So we'll see what we can do to make that happen. Okay, so again, right now, just using the brush almost like a pencil. There's a very, the, the brush will give, but it doesn't give all that much. Now, I like, I'm a very strong draftsman, so for me, everything gets distilled down through drawing. And some people are more mass driven, and they like to lay in more big masses of clay, so to speak, and then figure out like the particulars from that. You know, but uh, and that's there's nothing wrong with that kind of painting. That's actually a really beautiful way to paint. But 
right now I've got some abstract shapes I'm putting in the background, which are just going to be patterns of color abstractions to break up and support the head. So that's my basic scaffolding right there. Okay, it took about, I don't know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to do. Uh, you know, the first 20, 30 minutes of a drawing should be probably spent in that range. The drawing, now I'm going to kind of start filling in some of my darks and just uh, staining out the canvas because the canvas is actually, uh, is actually white. I did not use a stained canvas, which to some of you might be more desirable. But what I'm going to do now is just kind of kill the white with some large stains. So I'm going to start putting in some warm transparent red oxide and I'm going to let that spill over into the hair. I'm going to let it swallow up into some of the shadows in the face. I guess I can cool it down, I can bend it very easily. Um, we really have a light, warm light source so the shadows are going to appear a little bit cooler. But that doesn't mean ice cold, that doesn't mean blue, it doesn't mean, you know, necessarily purple. Um, it might be, uh, it's got some blue gray in it. I'm going to put in some um, olive green to, in the background, stain it in just to balance the, um, the reds that I've got going, the warm brown reds. And I'm just going to, right now it's very liberating, it's just like a watercolor. I'm using the turpentine, the Gamsol to dilute down the paint. And I'm just going through and staining my canvas out and letting abstractions of color interact with my and these interactions, these color transitions or these color stains don't have to necessarily be what's in front of you. It could be underneath and so maybe you have a warm upper layer that you're planning on putting on. You might want to put a cooler color underneath to vibrate off of that warm and use a juxtaposition of warms and cools. There's all kinds of ways to harmonize a painting and ultimately I think you want your color harmonizing to be very intuitive but um, some people don't have you know that strong of a knack for it and will try to learn color through heavy uh, amounts of uh, theory and I've never been one of those people so I don't find you know it just doesn't work for me so if you know you're going to see as I teach you in different courses or you watch me paint or if you're on the online school or something I'm going to walk you through all the things that I did to get proficient um, do, doing this stuff. So, you know, it should be very eye-opening for you. And I know many of you are at different levels. Some of you are professionals already. Some of you are um, aspiring professionals. Um, we still have to go through rigid training, all of us. You never can have too much training, um, in my opinion. Uh, so it's, it's always just keep reminding yourself, you know, um, never too late to get back in and do some uh, hardcore fundamental training that will help ground you and, and really give you a great sense of confidence with your execution ability in the future, whether that, again, whether you're aspiring to be a professional or you're just an avid learner that loves to paint. And, and, th and those are really the funnest people um, to work with because they're, they're definitely more apt to have a passion for it that's very, uh, you know, very, very sincere. And I'm not saying professionals don't, but when you start to become a professional, you have aspirations of professionals, sometimes that gets in the way of why you got into painting for, in the first place, which usually is not for the fame and the fortune, but for the love of the craft. And later that fame and fortune, if, you know, will sometimes follow because you're doing, you know, an, you're being very authentic and you're, you're living your life in an authentic manner and that can, a lot of times that will translate into success on a, a monetary level as well as other levels, I found. So, you know, you just, you know, it's, it's one of those things. So right now what I'm doing is spotting all my darts, and I'm doing it, again, with a lot of transparent maroon, transparent red oxide. And I'm just going for, you know, a nice graphic feel. And um, I, I've lost my drawing, I found my drawing, and I lost part of it, and I'm going to have to find it again. But that's, that's, that's painting, you know, you're in and out. You lose it, you find it, you, you lose it again, then you find it back and forth. That's why you want to be able to draw so well. Because if you don't know how to draw that well, you're relying on projectors or things of that sort, you know, once that drawing is gone, that projection vanishes, you are stuck freehand painting, or drawing, excuse me, in paint. And if you don't have a really good hand for that, uh, that could be pretty disastrous. So we want to really always anchor ourselves in really strong drawing skills so that we don't have to be reliant on other tools uh, as crutches. The eyebrow arcs high, 
down, sweep to the other side, pick up the other one. You come back over and pick up the outside to outside. You do that with the lid too and start running imaginary arc lines. Now these that's part of the, the Riley abstraction method. It's running a lot of times from side to side using rhythmical sweeps and tie togethers to get the painting locked down. Okay, so her face is actually a little bit broader in the cheeks than I have. And I just put that darker line in and I don't like that. So I'm gonna take a little turp with my finger and I'm just gonna open it up a little bit. Now this is a lead canvas, Frederick's lead primed. They're hard to find. You're not gonna find them in your local art store. You're gonna have to order them online if you wanna get some. It's a very Rolls Royce uh, surface, but it's very expensive. So if you're a newer painter, I don't know if I would run out and buy a bunch of them because, uh, you know, I'm working on probably a 12 by 16 and it's probably 25 bucks or something. So it's a little too rich for most people's blood, but you can always um, buy one and just use it, use your um, camera to take pictures of your efforts and then just scrub them. Now she's got this little feathery item in her hair, um, which is really cool. And almost like kind of a 20s flapper kind of look to it. And I'm going to kind of pull out a little of that with, through that stain with my, my finger in a rag. It just happens to be one of these better um, rags because this, this is a very porous surface. So it swallows up the, uh, has a tendency to swallow up the paint very quickly. And it's a little harder to get out. Uh, one of the reasons I like the lead is that it sets up quicker so I can get a better, quicker effect when I'm working quick like this and having to talk and, and do all these things. Okay, so I've got my head laid in more or less in a watercolor type manner. Now, the key for me, the first goal of any portrait painting is again to lock down the drawing. Okay. Uh, lock down the drawing and then I need to start covering the surface uh, logically. And I'm not going to look at particulars. Um, I'm going to kind of generalize. So I take some white, quite a bit, because she has a fairly, um, you know, she has, you know, it's pretty much peach, the face. It's going to be, you know, more like a peachy type tone. So I have it a convenience flesh tone. I think it's Holbein. Um, and it, and it, you can mix it with a little bit of yellow, a little bit of red, and a little bit of um, white. Any yellow, any red, any white will make up a flesh tone. It depends on the red and the yellow that you pick. Some might be warmer or cooler, depending on, you know, if you use an alizarin instead of a cad red light with as your red the mixture is going to go towards more of a pink and it's going to be a cooler pink because the the red is cold if you go use cad um you know cad red you're going to have a, a warmer mixture and it, hence the flesh tones are going to have a warmer feel and usually people you know depending on your lighting situation you're going to want a warmer not cooler lighting situation you don't want a real pasty cold unless somebody's like a redhead or something and has real alabaster skin tone, then of course we would, we would reconsider. But most of the time you want maybe the skin to be a little bit more on the warm side. And this corridor I'm painting right now is the cheek area and has a lot of blood flow. And it, it's going to ultimately want to, um, you know, want to be a little bit on the red, more the red side. Whereas in the forehead it's going to be a little more on, the, more on the yellow side and the jaw area maybe a little bit more grayed off or a little bit more, a um, little bit less. So I'm just going to come in here right now, I'm just kind of dumping on paint. As I come up to my drawing, or my map, I slow down a little bit. I don't want to blow through everything, but I also don't want to be so fastidious at this point that I can't paint with a little bit of um, relaxed uh, intention. Again, scrubbing around, painting around. Lips, she has really, really red lips, like lipstick on, I mean like really red, which is really cool. But we're talking, it's gonna be, you know. So I'm gonna kinda just, again, work that in, and not in a very uptight manner. I'll pick out the center of the lip in a minute. Right now it's just a big, to me it's a big kind of blob of color that I want in there pretty early on. Let's get a little bit of... Uh, 
I'm mixing up a little bit of color for the chin area, and I want to go a little bit, change the, the harmony of it a little bit. I've got a little bit of azo green in there, which is a gram color, and azo is kind of a transparent green, almost like Indian yellow or something, where it has a certain transparency to it, but it's nice for flesh tones because it's not very obnoxious. So I can get away with using, because I like getting some greens in the flesh tones, but man, they can get out of control if you're using like phthalo or something, or Windsor green, or, so you gotta be, you know, be kind of careful with it. Again, right now, it's more about just getting the thing covered. And again, with this surface, man, you really gotta pound in some paint because it, it gets pulled right back off if you don't watch out. So if you want a juicy painting, which I do, you just gotta really um, come in pretty heavy in the beginning. So right now I'm not worried about the shape of the lip being perfect. I'm not worried about painting a Vanderpool pair of lips or something. You know, I'm just gonna go in and get it positioned. Now this is very painterly style of painting, right? It's very much, very impressionistic. Got a nice cast shadow coming off the lips. The shadow is a lot darker than what I originally established. So I'm gonna start getting in and establishing the core shadow a little bit more. It's like literally, if this will file down your brushes in a matter of paintings versus months. But it's good, and we will just file them into slightly different shapes. So I'm just kind of going in. When I squint down the shelf, the sh shadow underneath the chin just kind of disappears into the shadows up here. And yes, well, we will differentiate that at some point but right now it's not really absolutely necessary it's just more a big graphic shape got some convenience yeah you know, my palette like i said is just so all over the place in a good way Just kind of get in the zone, relax, take some deep breaths, scan the model, scan, identify, predict, decide, execute. Again, that's something I talk about a lot online. Uh, SIPD, scan, identify, predict, decide, and execute. You want to do that in a really relaxed, natural manner. You don't want to be painting and looking and, and mixing all at the same time. That's an invitation for disaster as a painter. You want to stop, assess, come down, make a decision, and then pop it in. Okay, just kind of again cutting and carving with my brush strokes. Using the, broad, the side of the brush, not the tip of the brush. A lot of you are going to probably have a tendency to want to use that tip. It's not evil or anything, it's just not as, as good at cutting and carving shape. I've got to make sure that I maintain a little bit of this angle so that this lip here, need the, the node needs to start up here and then come down and, and be over here so we have a little bit of a downhill uh, slant to it so I keep that, that angle. Is that mine? No, you got another minute and a half. Okay. So again, just, just moving through. Again, if you have any questions, I don't see any coming in, so um, I'm not quite sure. Oh, shoot. It's okay. Let's get back to it. I said view all comments, and that didn't do that. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. It's okay.
it's still going. Yeah. Loading the comments. Okay, so there's a little keystone shape here between the eyes, and that usually has a little bit darker value because it's, a, it's ramping down, we have above lighting. It's not, it doesn't have a really strong bow ridge, but it's still going to have some effect you're on... Gonna, um, you're getting yeah, a bunch of comments. Okay, cool. So yeah, I didn't see you guys' comments, now I do. Um, yeah, as far as seeing, again, I see people constantly asking, can we see what the model looks like, this and that. Um, at this particular point, because we are streaming on the internet and we have to get permission from the models and we gotta get, you know, forms, all kinds of stuff has to happen to do that. I pr prefer at this point not to do that. Down the road, we'll look into it. So again, these are just kind of you watching me do my craft. And I know ideally, yeah, you'd want to have the reference out, you want to be able to see exactly what's going on. And that's what Timer's done. kind of will be happening on the online thing, on the online school. I mean, obviously you'll have all the reference and the material and everything pops up in the corners, all that kind of stuff. But this is a little different scenario. So I'm going to take a little break. I've been at it for about 25 minutes now. The painting's getting laid in, so um, yeah, we'll just take a little break and I'll maybe answer some questions while I'm taking a break here. So let me see what we've got coming in. Um, and then you need to find a timer that's going to work for you. Yeah. Is this, is, there, is that where it ends? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, so I see a lot of you, um, yeah, and some of you guys can answer each other's questions too, which I see you guys doing, which is really cool. Um, I will be working on getting a new uh, microphone set up for this, which is a lot better. We uh, had one, but we need an adapter for it. So some of you that are getting some sound issues, uh, that'll be being worked on in the next couple session so you'll 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 that'll be improved greatly so we'll keep working on improving it a little bit um, the main thing is we just wanted to launch this so we could start showing you guys uh, the different teachers and what they're capable of doing and also just to kind of let you see a little bit into uh, into these uh, these sessions so you kind of feel like you're maybe at the atelier a little bit but uh, but yeah we'll keep working on stuff so keep keep letting us know what the issues are and what what you're concerned about and we'll we'll start working on rectifying them I'm going to take a little break. I'll be back in a second. Uh, you know, about two or three minutes. And Why don't you write a comment here and just say model break. Be okay. back in five. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. Okay. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's going to be fun. <laughs> okay. Do you do this every Friday? Um, every other Friday right now. We just started it. Um, because we're doing an online, we have an online school now, along with our traditional one. Mm -hmm. So this is just a little something for people to see how we work. So all the teachers will be coming in every couple weeks and doing one of these. So sometimes it's painting, sometimes it's drawing. Mm -hmm. Just having fun with it. Cool. <laughs> okay. So you want to look back over there, and back. You had a little bit more to your left. That's good. That's really nice. Yeah, I think we're good right there. Okay. You comfy? Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay, so we're getting back into it. Let's see. Yeah, I think somebody asked if I uh, generally establish my um, shadow and light patterns first. And yeah, yeah, for sure. The shadows reveal the form. So I map it first and then I fill it in. And then I start modeling my form with more care. And not that I'm not using a lot of care right now. It's just I'll work my way up to... Um, you know, really nice looking brushwork, right? Right now, I'm not so concerned about how the brushwork's looking. Um, that, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in wanting to make really neat looking brush strokes. So, you don't want to kind of get the cart in front of the horse, so to speak. Okay, so we should be, there's a lag time, it's funny, there's a lag time of a couple minutes between what I'm doing and what I'm seeing on the screen next to me, my laptop. Okay. Um, someone asked how much like art models normally charge, usually it's 20, like 20, 20 dollars an hour. Um, that's what, you know, it depends on where you're at. I mean, sometimes LA is a little bit more, um, cause it's LA, you know, it's a little different. Um, if you're somewhere in Texas or something, it might be less, you know, I know that yeah, I've gone to different workshops over the years and, you know, from Scottsdale to, you know, whether it's Fredericksburg or whatever, I mean, they're, they, they differ, you know, so, um, it really depends on where you're at and what the going, going rate is at that area or whatever you know so let's see so I'm, I'm getting a pretty good coverage now I mean it's getting 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 there the first goal is to get the drawing in the second goal is to get it covered logically um, and when I say logically I'm not looking at all the subtle nuances of, of the darkest darks lighter I mean I'm just trying to get a generalization so I kind of squint down and I look at the model in front of me and I assess I'm not sure if our camera angle here. Let's see. So I'm thinking maybe my camera is a little low, so I might be wanting to. Well, we'll see. You guys tell me as you're watching if it's something funky's going on or something's not, you know, quite right. I'll I will adjust it. But just fire me over a little. Yeah, someone asked me why I put like a little bit of green around the mouth. Um, I like to use abstractions of color, and this is where people really get, con not confused, but I am not literal. Um, I have no interest in being literal. I like to manipulate, idealize, accentuate, change, alter uh, what I see when I paint, right? And not, not with reckless abandon, right? I want it to look like her head. I want it to look nice, but I don't want to be literal because literal color to me is kind of boring a lot of times it just doesn't have that panache that pizzazz that a fetchin would have or a painting like that where you know that's just that most cool looking color and I mean not cool temperature wise but neat looking is going to be um, invented because most color on the model is very you know it's gray color you're just not going to get a turquoise note or a gray green note really you're, if you're going to do that it's going to be you manipulating what you see and putting in a, a a note to vibrate off of another color or something of that sort so color is very relative and it's very much relative to what you're comparing it to a lot of people say well is that cool or warm well cool or warm compared to what what, what am i comparing it to 
because that's going to determine whether it's cool or warm. Not is it inherently cool or warm? Yes, every color has its own temperature inherent in it. But if you start comparing it to other colors, it will change that dynamic of that based on what you're comparing it to. So color is a relative concept. It's not a definitive concept. That's why it's very difficult to kind of teach it through theory. At least I've never had a lot of success because it really requires that you um, are constantly comparing it into the situation at hand. And so color is always changing, always varied, always altering. Um, it's why it's one of the most frustrating concepts. Although I think many of you will find if you continue forward in, a, in, in an intelligent manner training that as your value control gets better and your edge control gets better, color becomes less daunting, becomes less of an issue. Um, there's, it's really one of the most pliable of the concepts that you have to work with. Um, edges and values are have some compromising that can happen. Color has a ton. So you can't manipulate edges and values as much as you can manipulate color. And so you're going to run out of your your values way before you're going to run out of your color notes. So you can learn to turn form using small juxtapositions of warms and cools, inventing your color, manipulating your color, and getting a lot more bang out of your buck as a painter when you do that. So again, these are concepts that you've got to kind of learn from watching other good painters. They're not things you're going to learn from reading an art book or reading a book on color. Unfortunately, they're just not learned that way. They're learned from observation. They're learned from being around other good people. The hard thing is that most people don't have access to the kind of people they would want to be around. Hey, I see Rafael's on there. So um, he's an old student of ours from Brazil that came up and studied with us. It's nice to see you on watching. Um, yeah, the color zones on the face are, again, to me, on a male especially, you're going to get that Neapolitan type effect happening quite dramatically, which means you're going to get like the forehead being kind of a yellow ochreish kind of color possibly, or that it has a tendency to go towards that. The nose, the cheeks, and the ears are going to have more ruddiness or red to them. And then the chin, because of the five o'clock shadow, it's going to have more of a blue-gray or gray-green effect. And, and, and I say that leniently because it doesn't mean it's going to be green or blue. It's going to be greenish, bluish, blue-grayish. It's going to be kind of a, you know, a little bit of a, um, you know, just kind of a, a hint of that. But, yeah, there's zones, definitely zones of color that occur on the head. And, again, I'm just kind of right now trying to set up the tone, trying to again, lock down some of my, my key areas and try to get this thing kind of in a, in a nice holding pattern type feel. And again, I, when I look at this, I think I see it, I'm trying to get, it looks like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adjust the camera a little bit because it looks like it's too low. Um, unless I'm missing, no, maybe I'm missing something. I think it's a YouTube channel. I think we're good. Okay, so let me know you guys how it's looking on your end. I know this is not going to be as great as the online stuff because again it's not shot with the kind of equipment that we have at the studio that we shoot in so when you're doing this stuff on you know at the open studio stuff it's a little bit more, more difficult to get it totally dialed in because I'm using the studio obviously to teach in normally and so I can't tear it all apart and bring all tons of camera equipment in and break everything down and you know just be a nightmare so um, for now this is kind of how we're going to be doing it but it still should be very insightful I would imagine for you on, on many levels. Um, oh, painting is such a pure pleasure though. It's so fun to do. I mean, just kind of working up the layers and it's very meditative. It's very soulful activity. So, and, and you've got to be in a sense of awe and wonderment over how it happens, you know? I mean, it's not cold and calculated. At least I don't want to make it cold and calculated. I enjoy the spontaneity of random color notes and uh, the happy accidents that occur as you're building up a painting. And I, I, I revel in those happy accidents and I, I look for them. I, I, I rejoice in them. I don't, I don't look to try to dumb them down or try to, you know, force it to be a perfect rendition of the model. If I'm getting paid for a commission and, and, I'm, and I'm having to do that, then yeah, I'll, I'll put on my commission hat and I'll, 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 I'll be really vigilant and, and do a lot of due diligence on the, on the side of, uh, of, of, of capturing the likeness. But 
if I'm just in painting for myself, like I am right now, and just having some fun trying to get some practice in, uh, you're going to see me manipulate, idealize, cheat, change, alter, fix, work on, and I'm going to paint the way I want to see it, not the way I feel like I need to for some prerequisite because it's a job or this or that, you know? So um, everyone's a little different that way. Everyone kind of sets up their own, you know, way of, of handling what their parameters are for what they will we'll allow for deviation from a type or, or, or whatever the case may be. And I do paint a lot with my finger. I have not been up to this point, but you'll see me a lot of times come in and do a lot of smudging and and knocking down of the paint uh, occasionally uh, because it just the finger. I sculpt a lot. I have in the past, and uh, when you're comfortable with your fingers in that manner, you find that they're a very great. They're a wonderful tool to use. Okay. So those lips, even though the lips are like. I mean, they were just smudged in like really quick and, and unpretentious and they have a little bit of the white canvas coming through. They actually have quite a, a nice look to them. They're by no means where they need to ultimately be, but, but um, you know, again, that, that's kind of quite, quite nice. Okay, so going down. The hair cascades down and then just kind of drops off the base. The neck has a nice little uh, counterbalance to it because she's looking slightly over the shoulder. There's a little tilt downhill. Again, it's very subtle. When you have a subtle tilt like that, the tendency is for the eye to want to straighten it, like almost like a crooked picture frame or something that you kind of walk by and you want to straighten it up. So be aware of that when you're working from that situation because you may very well find yourself uh, straightening it up without even realizing it. If it's, if it's just off of, of, of uh, upright. So let's see. Um, other questions? Okay, so continuing to just kind of browse around here, looking for questions. There we go. Okay, so the hair is blonde, but it's it's kind of, um, yeah, it's like platinum blonde, but I'm going to kind of start with some ochre, yellow ochre, and I'm just going to kind of hit it around where the hairline starts. And in the shadows, again, we're going to have like, it goes kind of to a, almost like a grayish tone in the hair in some of the shadow mass areas, like in this area where it goes in the shadow. And I'm kind of just going to sprinkle in, using a soft brush, some stains. So I'm kind of restaining this area. Again, pushing and pulling in and out of the form. And again, some of you that are newer to painting um, or paint digitally are going to have a hard time, but shouldn't, because it's not all that dissimilar. Um, but the pushing and pulling of form traditionally with texture and, and on the canvas and pressure sensitivity does vary a little different than, say, using a Wacom or a Cintiq or something. Um, but the concepts are still the same. I mean, you still have to build the painting up. You still have to break down edges. You've got to get hard edges where they're supposed to be and soft edges where they're supposed to be. So I don't see a huge, um, big difference, you know, with it, as much as people sometimes claim. Okay, so the hair, again, that platinum blonde, I'll probably add a little lemon yellow to it. And... Right now, I'm not worried about making it look like any particular perfect kind of hair. I just want a shape, and I'll carve into it with abstractions of background shapes and other things that will help to describe it here momentarily. But just kind of watch how it evolves. It'll, it, it's almost like, you know, it's, it's like right now I'm pulling a lot of this information out of a soupy mixture of color. And I'm not hyper-analyzing it, I'm not hyper-obsessing about it. I'm letting some nice little happy accidents happen, looking for those, but not, not, not looking too hard. Everything is a kind of a combination of, I don't know, being vigilant, being patient, but yet also being, it's almost contra a lot of contradictions. You know, be careful, but spontaneous. I mean, those are both completely contradictory. But, um, but not, not you know, I mean, these, these concepts, that's why it's so hard to teach art, because art, you're constantly contradicting. You're, um, one person needs to hear one thing, another person needs to hear another thing, another person should, doesn't need to hear that for a couple more months, a couple more years. 
So one person should be doing that, other person should not even be doing, you know. So everyone's at different levels of where they, sh where they should be. And, and as a teacher, you have to constantly um, adjust your teaching to that person's particular needs, not generically teach. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, so it is difficult to do that. Let's see, do we have any more good ones? Okay, so I'm asking my, I want to, you know, do I want to put it dark over here in the background to get the head to pop? Or do I want to keep it high key like this and kind of blow the, the blonde of hair into a lighter background? I kind of like the way it looks right now. It's not my normal way. I don't normally work in that key. It's almost like singing out of register or, or out of your own, out, out of a, in, in a different register than what you're capable of or, or used to. It's sometimes you can do it, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, so... For me, I don't know. I, I'm always just looking. I don't like to make my paintings um, generically the same all the time. So I don't use the same palette. I don't use the same methods. I mean, I, you know, the general methods, yes. But I, I like to vary things a lot because I, I like to keep painting exciting. If I wanted it to be formulaic, I would go do something else for a living. You know, I want it to be, I want to be in the seat of my pants. I want to be kind of always challenging myself, always growing, always learning. And you don't do that if you paint the same way every time. Same palette, same setup, same this, same that. Um, and you see an awful lot of that around. But a lot of times it's due to the fact that, you know, these people are either painting for a living and have to do that in order to have a certain look or whatever, but they just can't afford the opportunity to, 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 to vary their working method out that much. Because they're under painting deadlines, they've got to get them done. If you're painting differently every time you paint, the chances of, uh, you know, having a painting go south on you is pretty good, you know, I mean, it, it's going to happen. And, and, and some people can't afford that, so they have to paint very conservatively. But when I'm in life class, it all, you know, you want to open the floodgates up and you want to just go at it, I think. I mean, I don't really want to be that conservative when I don't need to be. Okay. So, I will, let's see, mix up kind of a taupey green mixture here for this back on the side of the head on the right. So I do, you know, and then on the left I may keep it more of a of keyed towards the higher, lighter. I don't know yet. Again, that's part of the fun of painting like this is you just, I don't know, I'm not, I don't always literally use what it was put in the background up there. Up there, we have some drapery hanging behind the model. I may or may not like the way it affects the model or the way it works. And if, it, if it's not working for me, then I'll change it. And a lot of people that are literal will be saying, well, you can't do that. The background over there is green. I mean, it, what, you made it red. It's not going to hit the background, somehow come out and reverse itself and bounce back into the head. So we don't have to worry about the effects of reflected light from a background that's far away from the model affecting the, in, you know, the front aspects of, of, the, of, the, um, of the painting. It's just not, it can't happen. So for me, I'm not too concerned about that. I'm more concerned about harmonizing my colors, getting a nice organic feel to the whole painting, and trying to get it to look unpretentious and very spontaneous and fun to look at. You're entertaining people, so if the painting puts people to sleep and they just want to yawn, you probably missed something or you know it didn't quite hit the mark. And we've all done those kind of paintings. You know, we, we were very literal, we were very accurate, but at the end of the day, it doesn't win you any awards, you know. It just kind of, oh yeah, that's not, you know. So ultimately, people are only going to see the painting. They're not going to see the model. They're not going to see. Uh, chances are, and you want that painting to to really resonate with people, grab them and really hook them. So I'm always after that. I'm always going in and trying to accomplish that. Okay. So let's see. I'll make a few strokes and then I, I stop and I reflect on what I just did and ask myself how that affected the overall painting. How's the background interacting with the foreground? Um, you know, what, what, what's going on? What's happening? How does it feel to me? And that's very important because, you know, feeling and mood in a painting are everything. I mean, it's all about conveying something, you know, whether it's pensive or bright and exciting or somber and monochromatic, it, it all evokes some kind of emotion with the viewer. And, and you want to try to find the best 
I guess, explanation in this situation that you can. And then all we can do that is through exploration. So you're going to put some stuff down and it's not going to look great. Something's going to, you know, not resonate and then you got to change it. And that's okay. I mean, that's what we're, that's, that's okay. It's totally fine. I'm searching right now. I'm searching for what I want this painting to be about. And, and, and I'm not, like, you know, freaked out about it. I'm not overthinking it. I'm just relaxing and painting and enjoying Okay, so yeah, um, still thinking about what I want to do over in that left-hand corner, and I'm thinking I might go a little darker just to kind of get a little bit of pop off that side of the, the head over there to get it to, to really punch forward. And that's what's really actually happening up in front of me. There's a burgundy piece of cloth that's going, draping behind her head, heading to the, off the page to the left. And I, I kind of want to capture maybe some of that. The main thing is just, yeah, just having fun, moving the paint around. I mean, it's such great fun painting. It's ridiculous. It's really fun. The key is, you know, to, to think about what you want to do you know, and then execute it with as much confidence as you can possibly muster. And don't go in and dab, you know, and, and, and peck at the painting. Go in and really cut, carve, alter. And it does not with reckless abandon, but, but with real gumption, you know, real um, intensity to your effort. Intelligent intensity, controlled chaos, you know, going in and trying to really dial in this painting. And again, my influences range from Sargent to Soroya to Fashion to Zorn to all the great painters that everyone looks to for inspiration. People that came before us that set the tone for what can be done and what, what consistent hard work and, and effort looks like over the course of a lifetime. You look at something like Soroya and it's just mind-boggling how consistent and Sargent, you know, these are, you know, the canons of, of, of great painting and painters that came before us. And we want to look to them for guidance, guidance in the way they lived their lives, guidance in how they studied, guidance in what they painted, how they painted doesn't mean we want to become a duplicate of them, because that's not what we're after. It's more that we're after a consistency or a, a being synonymous with them. So when people think of your work, they think of it in the same way that they think of a sergeant or a Zorn or a Fashion or a Velasquez or something, you know. And, it's, and I mean, people would say, well, that's very pretentious or, or, or arrogant of you to think that you're Albert, you know. If you don't think you can somehow reach that level, then why paint? I mean, you, you should, yeah, you, there's no reason why you can't be another sergeant or you can't be another Duvernick or, or a line decker or anything. I mean, they were once students of art and they, they were students of art their whole lives, but they had to start somewhere. Just like you, you know, some of you are starting your artistic journey. You're in colleges, places, or you're training online with us or somebody else and, and you're starting your journey and you're looking to these other painters for inspiration. Um, guides on the way towards proficiency. I still look to them daily for inspiration, and I always will. And and I'm not embarrassed about that or or, or, or anything. It's just it's it's great to have access now through the internet and through other sources um, to really be able to look at these great painters and, and be inspired by them and see examples of their work on Pinterest or something or going on and really looking up these people. You can find so much information out there now. So much. Really a good period to be alive as a representational painter. It really is. One of the best. Okay, now the forehead's a little 
originally I just dumbed it down and painted it in very generic terms, um, almost like I was painting the side of a fence or something. You know, I just kind of squint down and saw the big general feel that I thought it had, and I just laid it in. Now I've got to go and say, okay, it's a little darker as it rolls to the left, so I need to darken that forehead up a little bit. So I, I grab a little yellow ochre, maybe, and a little bit of like some of that, um, some cat orange. And I go in and I notice her, her forehead is a little bit more, you know, has more planes and more tiles that I want to pick up on. And again, I'm kind of cutting and carving with this round brush on its side, so it's acting more like a flat. And a lot of people think that their brushes should be used, you know, they use it in such a limited manner that they're using only one tiny percentage of what the brush is capable of doing. And I, you know, so I like to try to push the brush a little bit more. Yeah, one of the, one of the, um, hey Klaus, how you doing? Um, that's cool to see you on here. Um, you've been doing awesome online actually. It's been really cool to watch your growth. And I know you've been working with Eric a lot and those guys, so it's really neat to, neat to see you tuning in. Um, you asked how I kept, keep my colors so clean when I'm smudging so much. That's, that's a very good question. And the thing is, is that color, all color is great color. I mean, if you look at a head, there's no pure color notes on a head. You're not gonna get a pure red. Her lips are kind of pure red because she's got really bright red lipstick on, but the face itself really is gonna be muted color. It's gonna be taupey colors, it's gonna be you know, gray greens, it's gonna be yellow grays, it's gonna, everything's gray. It's very seldom that you see notes of color on, in nature that are pure unless they're man-made or a flower or something. But most gray, you know, there's an old saying that the grays are the glue that keep a painting together, and they really are. And so I'm not so concerned about gray, you know, discordant grays, grays that aren't harmonious. Like, um, if the value is in the ballpark, meaning it's close to being right, you're hard pressed to find a gray that won't work. I mean, yeah, you could get a temperature slightly off um, and it, it might look a little bit odd, but you just gotta keep common sense. And sometimes you wanna slip a little cool into a warm area. Sometimes I'll flip the temperature of the highlights on purpose. In other words, the highlights on the face, maybe we have a warm light source. And we know that through logic that the highlight should be warm because the dominant light source is warm. I may sometimes paint that um, that light source. I might flip it to a cool just for the heck of it, just because it, I want to I want to engage the viewer and I want to create some some excitement in the painting. Now this gets into a realm where you, you know some artists would probably you know poo poo that or or be like oh you know that's really irresponsible for him to say that. Da, 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 da. I mean again you're going to hear ridiculous amounts of opinions flying. And all I can say is if they're dogmatic opinions, I would probably look at them a little bit cautiously. Never use blue, it's evil. Okay, let's think about that for a second. That's a pretty brash statement. And I don't, you know, I have heard people say re erroneous things like that, but, and, 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 and what's most more ridiculous is people actually listen to those people, which I have no idea why. Um, you know, I always filter it through, okay, who's telling me the information? How good of a painter or draftsman are they? And if this person is not a very good draftsman or painter, then I'm going to be a little reluctant to listen to them that much, right? I'm probably going to be like, well, I'm not going to be disrespectful or, or mean or anything, but I'm probably going to just, you know, take it with a grain of salt. And if it's Richard Schmidt telling me it, I'm going to raise a big eyebrow and really investigate further because he's insanely good. And, and as a result, you want to, you know, definitely his opinion weighs a little bit more heavily um, than somebody who's just spouting off that doesn't really have the skill sets, you know, or whatever. And you'll hear a lot of that. So you just got to be judicious or careful. Careful with who you listen to. Careful with what you put in your, in your, in your, um, in your mind and in your, in your, uh, and, and how do you, and as an artist, we emulate people. And when we emulate people, we, we look to them for inspiration and we mimic them. So you don't want to mimic people you do not want to work like or you don't want your work to be influenced by. It doesn't mean you don't, you know, kind of, you know, raise, you know, again, 
kind of acknowledge these different sources, but you don't want to be sitting down and doing master studies in copious amounts of work from somebody that you don't want your work to be influenced by. Okay, so always the, one of the determining factors on who you study with and how you study is, is make sure that the person you're studying with has the skill sets that you would like to obtain. If they don't, then you might be wasting your time, right? And that's just common sense to me. I mean, that doesn't, that's nothing earth shattering, you know, but, but it is something to think about, you know, because someone who labels themselves as a teacher does not mean they're good. That, 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 that's not, that's not necessarily what it means. So you'll, you'll get it as you go through your training and you get more familiar with different people and you, you get out there and traffic a little bit more, you'll start seeing, you know, you'll, you'll meet the people, the teachers, the ones that really are diehard teachers that really have a vested interest for whatever reason in getting you better than them. And, and, it, and for me, it's just always been something I enjoy. I enjoy coaching. I enjoy helping. Um, I, I have an aptitude for it for some reason and, and I, I'm good at it, but I, I, I like people. And I like to share my information that I have, and uh, that's that's I've always been that way. So, um, and it helps me immensely to do this stuff. You know, by me sitting here, I could be sitting in my studio right now painting by myself. But it's fun to come in and, and think that there's people out there that could really benefit from watching you do your thing, and, and it could help them maybe through some kind of um, tough spot they're in, or or maybe they're they're they've hit the wall or something, and they're thinking of giving up art, and then you might do some little painting study in front of them, and it, and it sparks something in them that keeps them going. And, uh, and that's cool. I mean, that's really a neat thing to be able to do for somebody. So, and again, you know, I have my own motivations with teaching. I mean, I've, I've taught for so long, most of my life, but I mean, I, I, I like to learn. And through teaching, I learn a lot. Um, I learn a lot about myself. I learn a lot, a lot about my weaknesses as a person. I learn a lot about my strengths as well. I get to um, build new strengths like patience and perseverance and compassion and empathy. And I get to work on aspects of myself that I can carry into my personal relationships, into my business relationships with galleries and gallery owners and collectors. And I, it's all these, it's, so it's, it's really, you know, helping me also in the process of helping you. So it's a nice win-win. And that's always cool if you can get that to happen. You know, always a neat thing. So anyway, just I'm, you know, again, I'm gonna, you know, go off on little philosophical tangents periodically, and, and if you've watched me online, and you're, you you know that that's my style. I mean, it's, it, I don't if if it's something that doesn't resonate with you, just push the mute button, or I don't know, go take a break, or just don't listen to me. I mean, or, or don't you know, just tune me out for that section, and just watch the painting happen. Okay, so. You know, the side on the left, I had it looking good, and then it went, now it's all wonky looking and has to be fixed up. And I mean, boy, that's just the name of the game with painting. It looks, you're on top of it one second, and the next minute you're chasing it. And then, it's, my dad always said it's kind of like a boxing match where you're like, you know, you, you, you're, you're, sometimes you're winning and you're, you're, you're the one throwing the punches, and the other time you're the one taking them, you know? And it's just back and forth like that all the way through the painting. And you just gotta have really tough skin, and you have to be thick skinned, and, and Get in there and wrestle around with it and don't give up. Never give up. Just keep pushing and keep, um, yeah, just keep getting, you know, stay in there. Stay in the mix. Stay in the mix. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Keep thinking. Keep analyzing. Keep, you know, using your best, putting your best foot forward. Okay, so some of the half tones on the side of the nose could be darker. And I could, by adding a little bit richer tone, half tone, I'll start to reveal the form more. So the side planes of the nose, maybe. Um, and I want to kind of, you know, again, the highlight that's coming down the nose, I would like it to have some sculptural integrity. I don't want it to just look like a pinstripe, you know, a car or something. Okay, let me see. Awesome things. Okay, so someone asked when I'll be releasing more drawing phase in the online classes. I just released head drawing phase three and figure quick sketch phase three. Those two phases alone, if you were doing them properly, would take you probably a month to two months apiece to get through. So you probably have about four months worth of those two phases alone. So yeah, I'm working on... Um, the next thing, I'm, I'm really working on all the phase three stuff. So I think I'm, I'm doing gouache master studies next, which will be uh, Leindecker, Cornwell, Frazetta, um, Rockwell, 
mostly illustrators, Elvgren, and I'm going to be doing little head gouache studies on, um, you know, showing you how to, you know, work up studies from these guys and what you'd want to be learning from them. So that's one of the next ones. Um, we also have a lot of the other teachers starting to produce content. So right now we have five or six phases backed up, and some of them are illustration phases, some are concept phases, visual development, creature and character design, creating illustrations, long still life. Um, yeah, we just got a slew. And then Eric's going to start working on anatomy. I'm also working on anatomy. So we've got a couple anatomy phases, but they're really hard to do. And they're well worth waiting for. So when you guys see them, you'll know why it took so long. Um, my, my, my goal is to release content that's just stellar, not to rush it out and see how fast I can pound out mediocre content. So um, there's already so much rich content on there. If someone was to go through that program and do the two, you know, 300, 350 hours that are there now, it would take you two years probably, you know, to get through it properly. So um, be patient, you know, keep pushing play, try to do these phases correctly, don't rush through them if you're on there. Uh, but good questions, you know, and, and yeah, you think this is a good time to ask me because uh, you have actually direct access to asking me a question, which is you can ask me whatever you'd like. Um, so yeah, this painting's coming out pretty cool. It's very, very um, painterly, which I like. Yeah, Klaus, uh, whew, you're asking about, oh, I'm going to print on male figure drawing book next week probably, large format, similar to those Russian books that were printed in China. They're 11 by 14 or so, and they're um, about 20 different drawings of mine, some of my better life drawing. Um, they're all done from life in the book, and there's going to be three images of each one, so you'll have lots of close-ups to work from, and they're going to be great study aids for you guys, and I plan on doing about seven of them uh, over the next you know, year or so, and so I'll be releasing those fairly regularly. They're just, again, like anything, they're just real hard. I mean, everything's hard to put together. It takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and if you do it right, then it's even, even more so. so um, but they will be coming, and thanks for asking. And, um, I'm really excited about getting my drawings out there because uh, a lot of them have been just sitting in storage or sitting in my um, so corner of my studio collecting dust over the years, and they could be being used to be studied. You know, people could be studying from them and, and, and helping their calligraphy and and things like that. So um, it, yeah, it was always a bummer that they were just kind of not nobody was getting to see them. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited to get those out. That'll be pretty soon. So look for that in the next I don't know month or so. The first one. So occasionally I'll get a little quiet, and it's just because I need to concentrate because I've been talking an awful lot. And what that means when you talk that much is that some of your your um, something's got to go. And what goes is the subtle uh, measurement, the su the subtle uh, accuracy of placement uh, starts to uh, starts to drift. So I want to kind of start reeling that back in. In order to do that, I need to kind of quick jibber jabbering so much so I'll probably be quiet periodically coming up um, a little bit not a lot but just a little <laughs> that's pretty funny yeah <laughs> the gouache classes are pretty awesome yeah they're, they're my second favorite to oil uh, I'm teaching it right now at the atelier and um, what I love about gouache is it's it's such a forgiving medium, number one, but it's also the only medium that, that uh, you can reactivate at any time. And um, and it helps to, to learn the art of tiling. I think that was the other... Um, okay, you're good, you're good. Go ahead and take a break, because okay. I forgot. I, I actually, you're good, you're good. Okay, so that, because that was, yeah, that's totally... That one, right? Yeah, you're good, you're good. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a little break, you guys. I'm gonna put a little note up here telling that I'm taking a break. Um, and again, just keep shooting over the questions. And I'll keep answering them as best I can. And I really appreciate you guys tuning in. It's really cool to, to get to, to do this for you. So okay, yeah, big time. Um, I'll be back in a little bit. And um, 5 a.m. in Sweden, huh? Gee, many Christmas. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the books that I'm doing will not be in PDF form. They'll actually be books that you would be buying. And they're, they'll probably be around, I think, $39 or so, somewhere in that $40 range. Um, they're large, soft cover books, uh, about 70 pages or so. 
and uh, about 20 different drawings with three images of each. So you have about 60 or 70 images, no text, not a big text guy. I mean, we'll do books in the future that have text, but these are really for studying from. So they're really for you to get to study uh, close up, you know, really high resolution, really nice. And because um, it's hard to find good drawing books to copy from, it really is. I've, I've had a hard time over the years uh, finding those. Um, so that, that'll be coming up, like I said, the next month or so. So I'm going to take a break. I'll be back in a bit. And uh, we'll keep working through finishing this thing off. Yeah, like, I would say to my friends, ask me to slash a little bit on the ground. 
So I took a little, a little bit longer break, but we're back, back in, and um, I'll start answering questions. Let's see. Um, let's see. I, uh, <laughs> There's a lot of funny questions coming. Through. Um, one of them was just like, what color are you generally using when you lay in a drawing? Usually transparent red oxide um, is one of my favorites. It's a um, very warm red, uh, brown, kind of like burnt sienna, but I like it a little bit more. It's, it's, it's a, the brand that I like is Rembrandt. And Rembrandt is, uh, I like Rembrandt's quite a bit, you know, their colors. Um, I use a lot of Holbein, I use a lot of uh, Winsor Newton, I use Gamblin, I use everything. Uh, Sennelier, I mean, you name it, and I probably use it, or have used it, or periodically use it. Again, I'm not totally uh, committed to any one brand or any, you know, I'm most particular about surfaces. Surfaces are by far way more um, problematic, so to speak, with, with affecting your painting than brushes, brush brands, paint brands, I found. Uh, so when I want to figure out how someone's doing what they do, painting um, a certain way, the first thing I want to do is find out what surface are they using. Is it a lead? Is it acrylic? Is it gesso? Is it masonite? Is it a linen? What, you know, is it, what is it? And, and again, it's not like I'm 
I, I'm really not after trying to become anybody other than myself, but I, I do use heavily, or rely heavily, or rest heavily on uh, learning through emulation. And that's one of the quickest, most efficient ways to learn. And that's by emulating means to, to mimic uh, something or someone and to pick up what they do through mimicry. And that's one of the fastest ways since it's a visual language, it's not verbal, although I can do an okay job verbalizing. Um, it's a, it's, it's very, pales in comparison to just watching someone really good do their, their craft. And the, the biggest dilemma that we all run into is that those people just aren't as accessible as we'd like them to be. Usually they're busy, they've got busy lives, families to raise, jobs to do, and teaching takes the caboose, you know, because it's, it's just hard. It's hard, it's, it's um, coming in and teaching fundamental classes, uh, head drawing fundamentals, figure fundamentals, going back through the skull. I mean, these are things that you really have to just have a certain mindset, temperament. I happened to start so young and built a school at such a young age that I was able to grow with the school and, and grow through the school. If I was trying to do start from scratch right now, at this stage of my life, it would be highly unlikely I could even do what put together what I ended up putting together. It just wouldn't be possible. My life's too complicated, there's too much stuff going on. I just, I, I wouldn't be able to stop and do something like that. So, um, I'm very fortunate that I, I, I was, I, you know, given the opportunity, I took it, I built it, I, I continue to build it, and I, it's just part of my life. It's part of the fabric of who I am now. Um, and and uh, I, I'm very thankful of that. But, uh, but I can see how difficult it would be uh, now that I, you know, that I've done it. Um, you know, looking back in hindsight, you know, you kind of go, wow, what was I thinking? I mean, I must have been crazy. Um, but, but yeah, you know, a lot of goods come from it. A lot of people have been, you know, um, enriched and, and helped because of it, including myself. So it's, I'm very, very proud of it, really proud. Um, okay, so the head is taking on, it's got a nice little feel to it. It's very angelic. It's got a, very much looks like it. it's the first time I've ever painted her. So I, whenever I paint someone for the first time, I'm a little nervous, especially in a situation like this where we're, um, Alive, you know, it's always nice if you're kind of somewhat familiar with the person's head, but but uh, but it's fun. I mean, it's fun to go in. Also, it, in some ways, it makes you a little bit more attentive because you are more a little bit more hyper aware of what's going on. So it's good. In, it's good and bad. So this neck issue down here, I can't just have this dark here. I mean, I want dark into dark's fine, but I'm, I'm going to need to do something to pull that neck out in a minute. Uh, it, even subtly, it, it, it won't be a lot, but I need to do a little something down there. Okay, I see a deep dark, so I'm using some transparent red, uh, transparent maroon down here around the mandible on the outside of the jaw where the hair is kind of encroaching in on the face. And so I'll go in and, and belt that in a little bit, kind of kind of knock that in. So again, I'm, I, I'll look at areas and I'll see where areas were originally laid in, but they don't have a lot of depth now, or you know they're kind of a little superficial. And then I'll, I'll kind of go in and, and work those areas up. So I'm constantly working and layering areas up to full contrast, kind of kind of sneaking my way up to the full contrast. I kind of think of it that way. Okay. The phase three workbook for quick sketch is taking a long time to do because if you see, uh, we just released the male one, right? And and, and, and it's gonna, I have, I'm stopping working on the female one because I'm working on the features uh, phase workbook that's gonna be releasing at the end of this month, uh, painting features, phase three uh, portrait painting. So uh, the quick sketch book for male will be already up, should be, and it's about 200. So, or 150 or something, I don't know what it was. It was something ridiculous. And so if you think that the female is going to be another 100, 120, um, I need, to, yeah, it's just taking, I want them to be really good, like I said, so I don't want to rush them out. So be patient, but um, you will be able to have plenty of mail. Just work on the mail for a month or so, because it's going to easily take you that long to get through all those sketches and get through them properly and really digest them. And then just save the female until I should have that workbook out in a month or so or less. But I had to stop it, like I said, to work on the, uh, the features one. So, um, so anyway, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, just, you know, uh, those of you who are um, looking for it, I mean, again, it's, 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 to me, it's just take the time and go over to another phase and 
there's plenty to work on and plenty you should be working on I'm sure so um, I totally understand but try to yeah just try to go 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 put your energy into another phase for a little while until that comes out and then once it does you can spend a, another month or so working on the female area of it but uh, but the male will, man that's that's a that's a meaty meaty phase so um, yeah I'm sorry it's taken so long but man it's it's tough okay um, Okay, so I'm just reading uh, Klaus asking, you know, what surface that, uh, with a little grip on it, and um, smooth surfaces, like this is actually a smooth surface, it's just, um, it's got a little bit of tooth to it, but it's mostly the fact that it's lead that swallows up the paint, it has nothing to do really with the texture on it, it has to do with the absorption, absorption rate of the lead. So I like, I like, you know, picking a, a surface like picking a, a fine wine to go with a meal or something, you know, you... You have to look at what you're having, and then you've got to look at how it combines, and you've got to look at all those aspects of it. And it's not so simple as just say, oh, I always like to use lead prime canvas, because sometimes I don't. It depends on if I'm painting a male or a female, an older male or a younger male, or an older female or a younger female, what, what um, textural effects am I looking for? Um, all these things have to be factored into determining whether, you know, what, 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 what surface I choose. So, I, you know, I'm notorious for going into a situation, like I almost picked a, a surface tonight to do this on that I've never used ever before. And then I thought, okay, I should probably be a little smarter than that. You know, yes, I could probably handle it, but if I really want to make my life even that much harder in the middle of a clutch situation when I'm trying to uh, put my be best foot forward for you guys and to show you some really cool stuff, I don't really want to be fighting the surface. So I, um, I opted for this surface, which uh, I've used a little bit more often. And then, uh, this weekend, I'll bring in, on the Sunday workshop, I'll bring in and uh, play around with that new surface and see what I think about it when, when I'm just playing around. So hopefully that, you know, answered your question, Klaus, uh, a little bit there. Okay, let me um, scroll down a little bit here. There we go. All right. Cutting, carving, sculpting. So painting to me is very much like, it's a sculptural process, especially when you use paint like Fashion or some of the more thicker a la prima painters that you, you might like out there. Um, and again, some of you might be tighter painters, that's fine. I, I, I used to paint really tight and I've gone through phases in my, in my career or, or as I was growing as a student where I, I really adopted some extremely tight painting styles. Um, and enjoyed certain aspects of them, but ultimately, you you know, you 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 try to find the one that uh, you know resonates most with you. Now we've got this kind of again these feathers kind of uh, stuck in the side of the uh, hair over here, and I'm just going to create an abstraction and hopefully get them to look something like something like that happening. But I don't really need the viewer to totally know exactly what's going on over there. They can have to maybe figure it out a little bit or maybe participate in thinking, oh, that kind of looks like some kind of flowery shape over there, or some kind of you know. Um, I don't want this to be the star of the show anyway. So, but I do want it to be interesting. I do want it to um, to be some kind of nice abstraction of shape up in that upper corner. And so, um, yeah, just been playing around with it. It's platinum, again, hair here. We need to... Go through and kind of cut and carve, and, and now I'm starting to get some of the the hair layering over the top of some of the darts. Um, so again, it's 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 not that different than layering in Photoshop. You know, I mean, again, this is another layer, and I'm, but you know, I have to be the other layer, the underneath layer is going to pick up, and I can't get rid of it, so I can't just undo it or, or go back and, and and play around with it like you could with some of the digital media. So you have to be a little bit more respectful of the fact that you're layering, but in real time with a gooey layer that's underneath it. You know. Yeah, no worries, Klaus. Nice to have you on watching. I, I appreciate it. Um, okay. So the hair is over on this side a little bit. We see a little sliver. And then we come down, it shoots up, over. So yeah, you never know. I mean, some weeks I might do a gouache painting for this. Um, one week I might do an invention, some kind of character invention, feature invention. 
Um, next time I might, you know, do just a long head drawing or a figure drawing, and then Meadow might come in and do a still life. So uh, just keep tuning in because you might, you just don't know what you're, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be doing. I mean, we're gonna be doing all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, the whole point is to try to get you guys engaged uh, from far away and get a, a glimpse into the atelier, uh, you know, lifestyle, the feel, what happens. It's a, it's a community. It's people interacting. It's people helping each other. It's people. Um, interacting in all kinds of different manners. So that's what we want to try to emulate online. And, 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 and up to this point, I really haven't seen a lot of programs that really have that involved. It's mostly just a bunch of you know stuff being dumped on the internet that's really sometimes incredibly neat to watch, but there's no curriculum flow or a way to navigate with it to get you to where you could do that yourself. It's just watching someone really good impress you through um, smoke and mirrors, kind of, you know, which, you know, there's something to be said for that. But uh, ultimately, we have to sit you down and say, okay, here's how I got to this level. Here's how I got other people to this level. These are the steps that need to be taken, and this is what we need to do in order to get you there. And there's no reason why you can't get there also. You just have to do the same thing. And the big thing you want to avoid is, is, is wasting your time with poor education or... Um, no education or self-education because self-education with no tutelage or nobody guiding you is very difficult and, and, and the chances of building bad habits is, is incredibly, it's almost impossible not to. And those habits have to be removed at some point by somebody extremely knowledgeable and, and that's really hard to find as many of you have already found out. So anyway, we're going to try to avoid that if possible so that you don't end up having to, you know, to, uh, you know spend a lot of time on doing some stuff later. Okay, so again, I'm reaffirming the jaw area, the mandible. Stop for a second, kind of catch my breath, look at what I'm doing. Um, okay, so someone's asking me if I'm cutting the paint with much turp, and also how long is my drying time? Well, I mean, the paint, again, it's not so much is it drying, it's, is, is it, you know, when you're on like a, you know, a surface that's really squirrely, like a, maybe sometimes, it depends on the kind of gesso you use, but sometimes gesso can be really slick, and some surfaces it's like ice skating, you know, you can't get the paint to set up, so it's just mushing around and, and, and dancing around on the surface too much, and it's hard to get it to, to be able to model any form with it. Um, normally in a studio environment at home, it wouldn't be as big a deal, because you, you can let it sit and chill and, and set up over the course of a couple of days and then get back to it or whatever, but in a life class, you got a very definitive time with which to finish your statement. And if you don't get it in in that time, you're kind of stuck. So um, the drying time is not taking that long, but it's not really drying. It's just setting into the surface so that I can actually go over the top of it easier. And again, you know, there's some cotton canvases that will emulate that. There's some Alkid canvases. Glossons is pretty good. Source Tech makes a good panel with the Glossons that's pretty nice for that kind of stuff. Um, again, I use Fredericks a lot because I, I, I just always have. Um, but I've used U-Track when I'm letting my own canvases. I'll sometimes use raw U-Track. But I mean, this is a whole other area that I could spend hours. And probably one of these days what I'll do, we're going to start doing podcasts pretty soon, once a month too. And I'll pick a topic that I'm interested in or something that I think you might be interested in. And I'll just sit and I'll... I'll, I'll, it's like an interview with me and I'll just sit and chat about it. So one of them will probably be surfaces and I'll pull out all these brands of canvas and different textures and different, and I'll talk about what I like about each one of them, how they affect my work, what I, what I do and don't like and why I use certain ones, why I don't use other ones. And then that might, that will probably shed a lot of light uh, for you on a topic that took me decades to figure out and, and to, to figure out on my own because there was no real definitive sources on all these different new canvases coming out and things that that uh, they just, you know, you kind of left onto your own to kind of figure it out, which ones work for you and which ones don't. So again, we have an inside gaze, outside gaze, inside here, outside here. That pushes this eye further to the right, this one further in. Uh, this one, this uh, iris is encroaching onto the actual uh, tear duct. And when you get an eye doing that, um, it can sometimes look like the eyes are, are not located properly. So you just gotta, be, it makes for a very nice portraits and some of the best portraits are done with those kind of gazes to the outside, but just, you know, they're, they're hard. So I want the dominant eye to be the one over here, I think. 
I'm trying to think which one I want to be dominant. Right now, either one could go dominant, but the one on the right, the way I've painted it, feels more dominant to me. And this is a good time to figure it out, and mostly because there's more white of the eye showing right here. So um, I pick up a little white, and I got a little round brush, and I'm just going to pop a little highlight in there. And then on the other highlight, on the other side, I'm going to pick a light blue highlight to use so that they don't compete with each other. I, you know, so, you know, to get one eye to dominate over the other, it could be something as simple as changing the value of the highlight slightly on the, on, the, on, the, on the eye that's supposed to be subservient and then let the other eye dominate a little bit. And, or it could be a little bit more rendering down on the, the in-focus eye and a little bit less, a little bit softer approach on the one that's supposed to be secondary. So it doesn't take much to, to, to direct the, the viewer's eye to the eye that you want. Because remember, when you look somebody at, in the eye and talk to them, you look them in one eye, not both eyes. You can't see both eyes at the same time. So whichever one seems to dominate, your eye will go towards. So in painting, you really want to try to force one eye to, to have a little bit more finesse. Um, the palette knife on this one, um, meh, not a lot. You know, if I do, it'll be in the background, or, or I'll scratch, like, for example, this little palette knife here. Um, you might see me, again, soon, start to tear down some of the features. Go right through an eye, the inside of an eye, and try to, because maybe I, I feel like the, the eye is getting a little too, um, I don't know, too outlined, too uptight, too fastidious, whatever you want, however you want to, you know, look at it. And then once I, I, I tear it down, then you might see me go back in again and then judiciously pick sections of it to re-accentuate. I'm using a tiny little round. And a lot of people would say, boy, it's a small brush. Yeah, well, that's a delicate area that I'm painting in. So I don't want to be going in with a ball bat. Um, I do need maybe a mall stick, which I'll get at the next break. I think I might have one here handy. Um, I know that I know that again the audio is a little bit thin, um, but we're going to work on that. So we should have better audio in the weeks to come. But just be patient with us. It's a work in progress. And again, these are kind of little freebie, kind of just trying to throw stuff out there to help you guys out. So we'll get we'll work on it. We're, our goal is to try to make it as good as we possibly can within reason. Um, but uh, but in the meantime, yeah, just just bear with us. So a lot of my palette knife work is done in peripheral areas, where I want a certain look, a certain broken color. Um, I want the paint to have a certain because you know palette knives have a very distinct look, and and not always great, not always not always good. You know, I mean, you've got to use them sparingly. Uh, sometimes I can get the similar effect with my finger mixing the, you know, pulling through the paint or something. So sometimes I want just, again, noisy areas next to subdued areas. But man, it's got about four minutes. Okay. So again, I just pick up a variety of colors. So I look around my palette, pick up a little this, a little that. And I kind of throw it down. So there's a little bit of peach in, the, in that mixture, which kind of harmonizes with the peach that's in the, in the um, actual face. And I kind of want to tie these colors together as well in an abstract manner. So when I'm doing palette knife work and background work, a lot of times I'm thinking more like an abstract painter. Um, I'm going in and I'm, I'm actually, you know, thinking a little bit more, more abstractly. Yeah, it's looking pretty nice. Um, yeah, we've got an hour left too, so this might not take, I might not use the full three hours on this one. Um, I don't like beating paintings up just to beat them up. So sometimes if the painting's going really well, and I paint a lot of gesture painting, many of you know, and gesture is usually an hour long painting. Um, I'll sometimes do, you know, really long efforts, but, but if the painting's going really well and it has a soulfulness to it that I like, four or five more hours on it, it's not going to keep that soulfulness. If anything, there's a good chance it'll beat it right out of it. So I don't want to always re you know, worry about that. Sometimes I, I, I'd rather stop on the head, so to speak. 
Um, yeah, Klaus, that's a good question. I still do question almost everything that I do. Um, you're never going to be so good, so confident that you you don't think about what you're doing. You know, you get to the point where you're intuitive in certain areas where you can let up a little bit on them and, and worry more about other more abstract concepts. But you're always, if you're if you're a really astute painter, you're going to be thinking, is that edge right? Is that value you're harmonizing with the other values? Did I go a little too warm, a little too cool? Sometimes you just got to let a stroke ride for a while before you can even tell. So you can't, you know, if you're constantly just taking out everything that you're doing because it doesn't look right, uh, there's many times in a painting when a stroke won't look right. And it's just, other stuff has to come in first in order to see exactly how wrong it is or how right it is. And, and uh, that, that, that's where real experience comes in. But, but only, the only way you get experience is through effort, and those efforts are going to be kind of rocky, usually, uh, for the first, I don't know how many you do, that you have to get them out of your system, but it takes a while. And so, you know, very good question. But, uh, but yeah, I still question almost everything. You know, I'm always slightly suspect of my decisions. Um, not in a negative way, just, just you know, respectful of the, of the craft, respectful of placement, respectful of everything. Art commands respect. The minute you uh, veer off of that respect for it, it'll just pop you right in the nose. You know, it'll hammer you. So yeah, no matter how good you are, it doesn't mean anything. You just, the better you get, the more careful you have to be, the more watchful, the more um, everything. Everything has to be, you can't let things slide as much. You can't, you can't use uh, the excuse, I didn't know, because you did know, you just didn't do it, or you weren't patient, or you got overzealous, or it could be any number of things. So yeah, good question though. So I'm going around this eye socket over here, and I'm putting in a little bit of gray. It's like a warm gray that almost next to the reds looks a little green, even though there's no green in it whatsoever. But it's funny sometimes how colors will take on almost a different temperature or a different look just based on what's surrounding them. Because that was basically some warm Rembrandt gray that I just put in there. And again, it looks almost green, but I like it. I mean, green would be a far stretch of the imagination to call that green. It would be, the, you know, green second cousin twice removed or something. More. Let's see. So the eyebrows arcing high. I've lost the one on the left due to blending, over blending. No big deal, but it needs to be found again. So I'm going to go back in and re, re find it. That that was my timer going off. So I'm going to take a little break. I'll come back. I'll probably spend about another half an hour on this. Probably be done about 9:30 or so. I don't know. Maybe I'll go the full time. We'll see. See how it plays out. But it's it's looking pretty decent. So I think we're in a good good position right now with it. Um, let's see. Oh, that's good. No, that can be. Yeah, I think you were asking, um, Raphael, what is the criterion do I adopt to use the knife? Um, sometimes when the paint is too thick and doesn't really feel the way I want it to, I'll use the knife to uh, create spontaneity that I could not normally uh, do through intellectual means. So I'll, I'll use it to try to bust through an area that is just feeling uptight to me or something. And I can't figure out a way to get past it, so I might use the knife to tear through it and see what happens. And it's not a desperation move, it's more of a um, searching for a look and that's the, the, the uh, again, scanning, identifying, and I, what I identified was that it's uptight. And then I start thinking about, well, what can I do? What brush can I use? What technique can I use to, to, to rectify that? And maybe the palette knife comes up as an option. And then I, I, I determine what palette knife I'm going to use based on what area I'm tearing through, what I'm trying to accomplish. And then I, I think about it, and then I make that move, and then I stop and reflect on that move and see what happened and determine whether or not it was a good call or a bad call. If it's a bad call, then I have to go back to that process again and figure out what the next move is to rectify that. 
But sometimes, you know, you know, desperate situations call for, you know, de desperate measures. You know, you just have to go for it. But, but usually, um, pallet knife for me is not so much a desperation move, but it is a, uh, an option for tearing or even applying paint in a more, if everything's looking too clean and it's starting to look kind of uptight, I may um, use that pallet knife to try to get out of that, out of that, uh, that mode of thinking that I'm in or, or something. And, and sometimes it, I just have to jar myself out of it, you know, because I'm, I'm in a funk or something, visually or whatever. So anyway, let's take a little break and I'll be back in a little bit. So you know, you come in and you, um, I'll be you, you know, that's and every other class is ten weeks on, and you sign up for the whole class, and uh, and it's it's a you've got eighty different classes that come throughout the year, and they range from the concept thing, the still life, the landscape, the portrait, the figure, the clothing, to the diary, the name, 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 Yeah. 
your trap to connect there, your pipes connect there, your dump connects there, and the whole stab room will not pull together at that point. So it's right there. Your stab room is it's probably just solid muscle trying to pull that kind of tight so that there's no more holding it. So that's a good floor. And that's what it was fun to say. But it's funny because now I really want to try it because my body wants to stretch a lot. And it's sort of nervous to do it. Yeah, no, it's okay, it's okay. It's just a slice of ice. Okay. And, and again, I'm not really keeping total track, so if you, if you want to watch your clock or something for five, feel, feel free to do that, because I might... You know, I might either be too late or too. I should probably just set mine, because because that way I can I can be a little more. I'm more thinking about the guys in you know Swiss Sweden or something. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, yeah, you, your husband should come in and check out the school sometime. Go with you, you know, stop by with you or something. Let's see. Okay. Okay, you guys, I'm coming back. Um, let's see. So we're at nine o'clock. It's been, I can't believe it's already nine. I mean, it's amazing that two hours have already gone by. Um, that's a neat, neat thing about painting too, I found. Um, let's see. Okay, so back, your head back to your left a little bit. There you go, and then just relax into it. There you go. Very nice. The nice thing about painting is that you lose track of literally time and that there's not many things that put you in that, again, that state of presence. So it's very, to me, very, uh, very, I don't know, just really neat, neat uh, activity, one that, that, that you can lose yourself in that much. Okay, so I'm going across and softening now. Now, I like, I like tiles, and I like a painting to look like a painting and not like a photo. Not that I have anything terribly against that, but it's just my personal preference is to have it be a little more painterly. So now what I'm doing is strategically going around the painting and looking for edges that I could finesse, soften a little bit, um, by dry brushing over the paint, with the painting a little bit. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit slower, getting a little bit more careful. You're not gonna see such, you know, brash movements yet. I haven't put my real upper layer, um, upper layer of finessing, which, which is the last layer of highlights and carving highlights in, and that last little phase, uh, which I'm working my way up to. I noticed the cast shadow on her goes a little bit further out from the nose, the nostril, the wing of the nostril there. So I want to kind of clean that up a little bit. So now, see now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm going back and, and just seeing if I've forgot anything or, or something that slipped through the cracks or maybe something I could just put a little bit of effort into and make it substantially better. And again, my, hopefully my mall stick isn't getting in the way, but. I'm using this small stick to balance my hand out away from the painting so I don't get my hand all over the paint. Some people think that that's cheating. I don't quite understand that. Painting's hard no matter how you slice it. So if you have to use something to balance your hand on, maybe you've got a shaky hand. Maybe you have little tremors or something. Or I know a lot of painters that suffer from kind of that shaky hand. Maybe they drink too much caffeine. Maybe they're, I don't know, they just have a shaky hand. I have a pretty steady hand, but when I go around features and I'm going into lips, around the nose, around the eyes, I'm going to use something to balance my hand on a little bit to give me a little extra, um, you know, a little extra balance. And I don't think that's that's a bad thing. Again, you can put it on with your foot if you want to, if it looks good. I don't really, you know, it wouldn't bug me. You know, I mean, I think painting is... There's a lot of, it's a lot about, um, you know, thinking outside the box and being very ingenious about how you handle your situations that you find yourself in. It's not cookie cutter, cold calculations. It's, it's very rhythmical and very um, liberating process that has to be constantly reflected on it and, 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 you know, when you're, when you're working through it. A little upper lid separation here around the orbicularis as it goes into the socket. 
Yeah, this is an okay mall stick, but it does slip a lot. It's because it doesn't have really anything to hook onto aspects around. So I'm, I like something that has a little hook to it. You know, a little something I can hook around the side of the easel or hang it on something, you know. Now, with those lips being that red, I'm feeling the inclination to put a little green, gray green underneath them to, ref or, you know, kind of balance off of that. Get, you know, vibrate a little bit off of that, create a little complement and a complementary type relationship with the lips. But I'm not going to go green like it's like, oh my god, look at that green. You know, it's like, whoa, you know, green. I don't want that. I just want greenish, like a little olive green or a little bit of viridian in there. You may not even pick up on it on, probably you won't want to see it on the screen, but I'm just, that's why I'm talking to you. Uh, about it, you know, and uh, now again, for those of ultimately for those of you who are online, these these um, demonstrations will become an archive of a library archive for you to refer to periodically and rewatch if you feel so inclined. Um, and 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 so they'll be free, you know, for everybody the first night I do them, and then they'll go into the archive, and those people that want to refer back to them will be, you know, able to do so if they're online, but, but otherwise, it, it, that, you know, that's kind of how it'll work, but, okay, so I'm kind of coming through here, I, got, I had a little bit of, like, reflected light in there that got a little much, so I want to knock that down a little bit. And looking around, where the hairline meets the forehead, there's a little darker area. But I don't want to get too dark, but I'm going to kind of want a little bit of that interaction with the skin tone. And, Okay, so I'm looking at now, again, I, so I go from the interior to the exterior, back to the interior, back to the exterior, constantly going in and out of the painting, back and forth. That way I bring the whole painting up together, and I get to reflect on how the painting's interacting with background to foreground, foreground to background, how the color harmony is affecting it. You know, bad color harmonies in the background or bad brush strokes would, could kill the painting. You could have the most beautiful interior aspects of the painting and you flood that background and all of a sudden the painting is dumbed down 50% and, and isn't very, um, you know, it isn't, isn't very successful at that point. Okay, so Klaus is asking if I go back in later phases and change color tiles because via break or time passed by you seem to see different things on the model or do you try to be careful with changing a lot? Um, to me, because I'm not literal with what's in front of me, I'm reflecting on how the painting's evolving and the color choices I make, since they're somewhat fictitious, uh, meaning that I like to manipulate them and, and sometimes inject color notes and tiles that don't exist, but the values are holding very strong. So that's what I'm most concerned about, is are my values and shapes still have the integrity that I intended? The colors, to me, are an exploration and are part of the creative aspect of my painting style. It's where I get to have some fun. It's where I get to put my own signature on it. So I'm not as concerned about the tiles being perfect or whether I have to change them because chances are they're slightly different from what's up there anyway and that the new color harmonies that are being created are creating a new dynamics within the in the painting that I have to reflect upon and respect because they're not literal, so therefore I can't look at the model in a literal sense because I'm not copying it literally. So I use it as a benchmark. I use it as a um, kind. Of, I look at it for inspiration. I look at it to guide me, but I don't look at it as a literal guide. I look at it as a very general guide for me. Now, some people are going to be more literal and have a tendency to copy the model at a greater level because that's how they were trained or that's how they like to paint. And those are going to be more like you know. Um, and there's nothing wrong with this. So. As I mentioned names, just know I have the utmost respect for these painters. Jacob Collins, right? David Kassan. These are guys that are going to paint way more literal than I am. Um, and that's just their choice. That's how they like to paint. They're phenomenal painters. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different 
uh, philosophy, a different way of thinking about the same problem and solving it. So I kudos to them. You know, they're phenomenal painters. I respect them greatly. I look up to each one of those guys. Um, and I paint a little differently than they do. But isn't that awesome? I mean, you, you know, the world is not supposed to be everybody painting the same way. So, you know, you want to stretch yourself. You want to adopt. You know, you're going to have people that love what you do and people that do not. Um, you should have some range to your ability. Like if I wanted to go paint like one of those painters, I could very easily adopt that method and go over painting that way in a very short period of time. I'm 100% confident. But I choose not to. But I do have that option if I wanted to for some reason. And options are good. Um, as a painter, a professional painter, you, you really need to have a style that's consistent. And, you know, I have had, over the years, kind of a luxury of, of not having to commit to a style because I teach and I do other things, and I was able to not have to do that, um, which I very much was thankful for because I don't like to be put into a little tiny compartmentalized hole and have to paint one way forever just doesn't resonate with me, it doesn't please me. And so I, I find that I like to jump around, try different styles, play around a little bit. I mean, again, I don't, I don't want to be um, schizophrenic with my jumping around or anything. I just want to still have the freedom and the ability to explore and to grow and to try things. So that's always one of my, one of my you know, things that I've wanted to build into my career was the ability to, to, uh, to always have growth the opportunity for growth and to, and to continue changing and growing and altering and morphing and teaching allows me to do that. It allows me to work with lots of different people that have lots of different styles so I can, you know, paint on one person's painting this way and then the next person wants to learn this. So I, I bend my teaching around that different way. So it gives me a lot of uh, that kind of freedom, which I enjoy greatly. Um, and it's probably one of the reasons why I do like to teach so much. Um, it asks if I'm using daylight or cool light to light my model is one of them. And, um, you know, I, I, I usually, we have a soft box at the school that we use to emulate north lighting occasionally in some classes, depending on the class that we're doing. But in general, we usually use an incandescent warm light, about a 300 watt bulb. And um, I find that to be, uh, I find warm light to me to be more desirable than cool light personally. Uh, working under cooler light, you do have a tendency to paint warmer because you overcompensate a little bit or you, you have to compensate for that. Um, I don't think either one of them is better or worse. Um, in my personal studio, I use uh, Verilux color corrected bulbs and I try to have the same uh, temperature on my palette and on my surface that I'm working on. So both the bulbs that are lighting my palette and the bulbs that are lighting my actual painting are the same temperature, same wattage, same bulbs. Um, but other than that, I, I'm not ridiculously particular about lighting uh, as much as some people are. Uh, my thing is surfaces, Schmidt's thing is paints, and, and he's particular about a lot of things and he's very knowledgeable. So, um, But you know, everybody's again got their different way of, of, um, of doing stuff. You know, I, I remember going to see Frank Frazetta and I got to spend a day with him years ago when I was young and uh, one of my favorite painters of all time and uh, for his entertainment value of his paintings, the strength in his compositions, the beauty in his, his poses. Everything he did to me resonated with me as just being awesome. I mean, not everything, but the general way that he thought and the way that he presented paintings was as an entertainer. He was entertaining people. He never picked a boring pose. He never, he always tried to get the best out of the model pose, the best out of the situation. And I think that's, that's there's something to be said for that. You know, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and, and that goes into the realm again of, of imagination, invention, manipulation, not being strictly confined to what you see. And uh, so I, I, I adopt more, a little bit of that philosophy um, than some people. In order to have that ability to do that though, one of the prerequisites I believe for doing that is that you have to train a lot harder memorize a lot more, study for a lot longer, because the information has to be retained. You're not just simply using observation to paint, you're using observation, cross-referencing intellectualized information that you gathered academically, 
So you're, you're actually using many different areas of your brain and you're drawing upon many different areas to do your painting rather than just observation. Although, you know, I think Sargent would have probably said just paint what you see and, and more, more of what you see, less of what you know. And, and how, how can you argue with that guy I mean, as far as his results? But yet, yet you'll look at a portrait he does of somebody and then you'll look at a photo of them and it, and it doesn't look much like him. I mean, he's strengthened the jaw, he's changed this, he's changed that. Of course, there's subtle changes, but changes nonetheless. So I don't think he was entirely painting exactly what he saw. I think he, uh, he again, was manipulating the, the information to get the best possible painting of somebody because that's what they were paying him to do. So um, I think for him, you know, even though he was so accurate and so procedurally uh, superior to most people I've ever seen, um, he still did a lot of manipulation. Maybe not as much as Frazetta, obviously, but, but still a fair amount. I mean, my teacher used to refer to Frazetta as a great beer and Sargent as a great wine. Both awesome in their own right, and when you, you know, there's nothing like a great beer when you want it, and when you're in the right situation, there's nothing like a great, great wine. So they both are great. They just, different situations, you know, they, they shine more, in, you know, but, uh, but, but they're both great painters. You really can't say which one's better than the other. Um, they're just different. And thank God they were, because, man, they both contributed an amazing amount to art in their own way. And, uh, and, and I, I love that. I love that about them, both of them, you know. So, and, I, and they're two of my favorite painters. Okay. But I think it's funny because some fine artists will be embarrassed to, to talk about someone like Frazetta and say that they like him because, God forbid, you know, somebody thinks that, you know, Frazetta's kind of lowbrow because of the stuff that he painted or the subject matter or whatever. Um, and, and they don't want to be, you know, you know, dumb down their, you know, their, their sophistication or something. I, I just think it's a bunch of malarkey, you know. It's goofy, goofy. Anyway, um, what do we got here? Any questions with possible? I mean, super freaking expensive views. Okay. Yeah, newsprint is hard to find. Um, uh, I, you know, it's funny because Seth Cole. Um, uh, Canson, um, De uh, Dealer Rally, uh, they all make a smooth newsprint. Uh, Strathmore, and I can't believe, some of those are actually European countries, I believe. I mean, I mean not countries, but European companies. So I don't know why you won't, wouldn't be, like for example, Conte Pencil, people saying they can't find Conte Pencils, and it's like, it's a French company for God's sakes. I mean, it, it's, you've got to be able to find it in Europe, I would imagine. Um, they can't just only be shipping to the United States. So, you know, I, I don't know, with the internet now, I think everything's possible, everything can be found. If you need to modify some of your materials, uh, do so. I mean, um, if you can't find newsprint, find the smoothest uh, bond type paper or something, something that's somewhat similar, and you'll still get a lot. I mean, you're gonna get a ton out of studying on that. I mean, I've had, you know, but, but, uh, but yeah, if you can find that smooth newsprint, it will help and it will be um, a nice thing to have, but again, you know, there's still ways around that, so don't freak out too much if you, for some reason, can't find exactly what I use or something, then uh, adapt and overcome um, when necessary. But keep looking for it. I'm sure it's out there. I cannot imagine that you cannot find, well, maybe, I mean, I don't know. But, but yeah, maybe a little expensive, but uh, I, I've ordered stuff too, like if I want to get rosemary brushes, you know, unfortunately, she's in England, and I gotta pay all the shipping and, and all that stuff to get those brushes because they don't sell them in the stores here. So, um, you know, from the flip side, we're, we, we sometimes have to do the same thing. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to find stuff that maybe is only available over in Europe or something. Those Russian books are almost impossible to find on, the, on Russian draftsmen. And, you know, uh, so, you know, some things are always a little more accessible and some things are less accessible, but there's always ways around it. So, so uh, try to do your best. And forget the rest, you know. Just try to try to, you know, find something that's similar. It's like working from photos versus working from live models. Of course, live models, you know, afford a great opportunity to learn. You know, 
three-dimensional form and painting atmosphere around something and, and having to deal with a moving model and slight movements that have to make you work, work a little bit more from your memory, which is good to cultivate that ability. But the 90% of your work in the, in, in, as a professional will probably be done from, live, from uh, actually photographs. I know my, my, that's how I do most of my fine art work. Um, uh, I paint from life all the time so that I can stay tuned, but I don't, I don't expect to really be able to hire models for everything I do and work all the way through with them. So I, I do the best I can, and photos are an incredible um, tool to use, but you have to learn how to use them correctly, just like anything. Projectors are amazing tools, but you've got to use them correctly. The, cam the camera's a great tool, got to use, you know, use it correctly, same with the computer. So everything, there's no bad tools, it's just reliance on them and, and crutch, you know, using them as crutches and things like that that can cause some issues with, with them, you know. Okay, can you kindly summarize your, uh, observe, interpret, okay, thank you for that question. Okay, so I'm going to say that again. Um, okay, so I use, you know, it's funny because back when I was riding motorcycles and, and uh, first learning, I, I took a course with the California Highway Patrol, which is the motorcycle police for, um, and they're incredible riders, right? They, I mean, they ride all the time. So they had this saying, scan, identify, predict, decide, execute. It was called SIPD. So S -I, SIP D, S I P D E. So you scan the road, you identify potential hazards, you um, predict what's going to happen, you decide what you're going to do, and you execute immediately without thinking. So it's scan, identify, predict, decide, execute, otherwise, you get hit by a car and killed. So they taught that that's kind of the method that you have to use in order to be safe. When you come to an intersection, scan the intersection. Look for the potential guy that's going to run the light. Don't give him the benefit of the doubt. Assume that he's going to run it and then make a decision, make an evasive move, floor it, break, whatever you got to do, and do it with complete conviction. Um, and you have to learn how to ride like that in order to avoid accidents. So in painting, that kind of works the same way. You scan the painting. You know, you identify things that are happening, things that you would like to have happen. You predict what needs to be done in order to get those things to happen. What kind of brush should you use? What kind of pressure should you use with the brush? How, what kind of stroke should you pull with that brush? How much paint should you have on it? What colored paint should you have on it? What value should you have on it? All those things have to be assessed every time you make a decision. Okay, in the beginning, that's gonna make your painting really slow because that's a lot to think about. When you're more intuitive, like, like I've gotten to be, that process becomes a lot faster and it's not as overwhelming and daunting. But if you go into a painting and you're looking and you're analyzing and you're mixing and you're painting all at the same time without leaving a little bit of breathing room between that process, you're gonna get a really sloppy, crazy, chaotic, out of control painting, almost guaranteed. So we need to, we need to do that process, but we need to do it in a very um, intelligent manner. But anyway, that, so I've adopted that, that particular saying, that particular concept, and, and kind of used it as a nice analogy for uh, painting, because I think it dovetails really nicely with that, the concepts uh, that I'm talking about. So um, again, scan, identify, predict, decide, execute. And it should almost be like a mantra for you. So just keep saying it, scan, identify, predict, decide, execute, scan, identify, say it a thousand times, say it 500 times, say it while you're painting, say it when you're not painting. Start thinking that way so that when you come into a painting class or you come into a painting situation, you're a thinking painter and not a reactionary painter. You're not just reacting, you're actually thinking and then reacting. And that's gonna give you conviction with your paint strokes. It's gonna give you vision to your procedure. It's going to guide you through the painting as best you can at the level that you're at. As your knowledge base grows, the ability to do that is going to become more efficient and more intuitive, and sooner or later, it's, not, it's just going to be part of the way that you work, and you're not going to have to recite that anymore. You're just going to, that's how you're going to paint. So I really think it's something to adopt, something to think about. We are, um, all good painters have good procedure, whether they put it in place accidentally or uh, deliberately or, or somewhere in between. They sooner or later come to a procedure like that. Otherwise, you know, painting is, is just a it's, a, it's a train wreck waiting to happen, you know. Um, uh, 
Oh yeah, no worries, Klaus. I didn't. I didn't. Um, the newsprint. Don't. Yeah. I, I know that a lot of people have been talking about how difficult it is to get, and I think um, you know I'll keep my ears out and eyes, you know, out for for sources for that, that I can pass on to you guys. But no, no worries. Um, I didn't mean to react in such a way that maybe you thought I was kind of uh, dissing on on that whole thing. Um, I was just saying that uh, it's amazing to me sometimes that uh, certain brands like Conte. Uh, being a French, you know, that they're so hard. And they're hard to get even here. I mean, they're very difficult to uh, to get. Uh, yeah, I have always have a hard time getting my the Conte pencils stocked at our school. But uh, but anyway, um, yeah, you guys will, you guys are very resilient, I can tell already. And you have to be when you're learning at distance. Um, but, but we're going to lay down things so clean for you that uh, you're going to be, I mean, it's just going to be amazing for you. So um, just keep going, keep looking for that stuff, keep... Um, pecking away at it and uh, and before you know it you guys will be rocking and rolling I mean doing great already some of the stuff I see you guys posting is pretty amazing the growth that's already happened it's just it's, it's ridiculous in a good way um, it's really cool to see so now I'm going into my highlights and I'm looking at where are the where should the brightest highlight be well this size secondary this is more primary I probably want my you know Part of me says I probably should have picked that eye as the dominant one, but I'm not going to worry about it at this late juncture. I'm just going to, um, you know. So now I can start thinking about my upper layer of paint. And this is where, you know, how painterly do I want to get? Do I want to really cake it on? Do I want to have a hybrid of half and half? Um, I'm going to go somewhere in between. So, I'm, I'm, you know, I want the highlights that are going to be some of my, right? Because the old saying is, Load your lights and thin your darks. So your darks should be thinner than your lights. Now that, that's a relative term, and also just like color. If you're painting like Schmid, or well, I wouldn't say Schmid. Uh, so let's say if you're painting like Fetchin, you're so thick in your lights that your actual shadows could be almost pretty opaque and still read as transparent somewhat because of how thick you're really going in your lights. So a painter like that can get away with a lot thicker shadows than, than a thinner painter that's like, like again, a Jacob Collins or a, a you know, Bouguereau or something like that. Those painters are going to have to be a little bit more um, conservative. But the ratio will be de determined mostly by how you decide your painting is going to be, how thick it's, it, it's going to be. So right now I'm modeling my, my um, hi highlights. And the thing to remember about highlights is they should fluctuate. They shouldn't just be the same width. They're, going, they're coming down anatomical nuances. So as they come down those, those nuances, they're going to expand and contract um, as they come down that form. They're not just going to be the same width. Uh, so they act very much like core shadows. They, they actually fluctuate. And so the more you know your anatomy, the more intuitive and more understanding you have of how to fluctuate your highlights and your core shadows. And that's another argument for just really knowing your anatomy, um, ultimately, because the more you know about it, the better you are at doing that stuff, and the easier it gets. So um, something to think about. And again, like I said, if you're on online, be patient. We've got a lot of anatomy coming your way, but, uh, but it'll take a little... It's, those, those ones... Yeah, I mean, I'm doing one of them right now that's just insanely cool, that it's just bringing me to my knees uh, on how much uh, prep work it's, it's requiring um, to, get it, to get it to fruition. So uh, I'm not going to say too much about it, but when you see it, I think you'll understand exactly why. But, uh, but ultimately, we'll have about six or seven phases of anatomy that will uh, have very specific reasons for being taught. Everything from figure invention all the way to Riley rhythms, coordinating with anatomical knowledge uh, to redo enbridgement into articulate an articulate way to study it that uh, is more user friendly. So, yeah, lot to lot to look forward to. Lot to look forward to. Okay, coming through, coming through. Softening edges, rehardening some edges. Having fun, trying to stay present, trying trying to stay in in the in the pocket here.
he put a little reflected light down in that neck to get it to pop a little bit forward a little bit more. There we go. Okay, again, most two-hour paintings from life are going to be vignettes, meaning that they're going to be prematurely ended in an attractive manner. Got a little wonky color on there on my finger there when I went to smudge that node. That's a little tendinous attachment on the outside of the mouth. We call it, well, it's a node, but it's a tendinous node. But we are going to just um, look carefully at getting that nicely indicated. Yeah, and I go through phases, like I said, you know, sometimes I use palette knife a lot. It really depends, I mean, on my mood. Um, so much of painting is, is, is just a feeling, a feeling about, the feeling of confidence, um, trying to muster up that, 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 you know, sometimes you just don't feel very confident. Sometimes you feel really confident. Sometimes you can't buy a good stroke. Sometimes you can't put a bad one down. So it really, a lot of it, just such a dynamic process. You really have to always be, you know, kind of, just trying to figure out on the fly, like moment to moment, how you're feeling and trying to direct that feeling so that it's really positive and really uh, conducive to doing good, good work. Yeah, you guys, um, I'll probably be, sh we're gonna be shooting these, um, like when I'm done with this, I'll shoot a really good picture of it and we'll probably turn it into a quick YouTube quick, uh, little quick drawing or quick painting. We'll all run through it like in super fast mo. And at the end, you'll see a finished image of it. Um, and even online, I don't know yet. It's too early for us to know, um, you know, how, what we're gonna do with these and everything. But, uh, but we will continue to, um, to, to do stuff, you know, we'll figure it out. So just be, yeah, be patient with it. Um, I see someone also talking about the Wolf's Carbon and, um, I like that pencil a lot. That's uh, my second, well, it's, it's one of my favorite for this technique of drawing that we do uh, at the Atelier. Uh, the Wolf Carbons, but get a 4B or a 6B instead of a, a, uh, a B, because the Bs are as hard as a rock. Um, yeah, Jim Hahn, uh, one of our teachers, actually just ch chimed in a little bit, which I, uh, is very cool. How are you doing, Jim? Um, he asked if there's any particular reason why people say the Riley method of painting is good for illustration purposes but tend to disavow it for a fine art painting. Um, you know, the Riley method is still a cryptic style of teaching and learning that many people, it just, it's been kind of out of the mainstream for a while, but it was originally, um, I think, used by illustrators more because of its, its efficiency with creating a um, controlled environment with which to work on tight deadlines. You, do, you know, you did a nice underpainting that uh, kind of acted as a, a security net for you. And then um, on top of that nice uh, security net, you just added a uh, very uh, controlled color that was already pre-mixed, which is very fast to do. So I think it just lends itself to a faster way of working, which is extremely critical and crucial for um, illustration. And so a lot of illustrators adopted it, and as such, it got kind of considered more of an illustration type technique, even though um, throughout history, uh, tons of people have done Grisil and different methods of underpainting with color on top in a very similar manner, maybe just not with such a controlled palette um, that was broken down into, you know, X amount of 36, whatever, 40 colors and, you know, all that stuff. But, um, so, it, it, you know, it's, it's been kicked around back and forth between both fine artists and illustrators, but yeah, a lot of the, you know, illustrators did kind of adopt it because Frank Riley was more of an illustration illustrator himself, as was uh, Fred, Fred Fixler, who was my teacher. So I think just the fact that those guys did so much illustration, it kind of got coined as more of an illustrative method, even though I, I don't see it really, I don't see much differentiation between using it for fine art or illustration. You know, good painting methods, good painting method, regardless. Good question there, Jim. Okay, how does music change your mood as an artist when you are creating? Um, you know, I like all kinds of music. Right now I don't have any on because it would be very, you know, kind of 
it would you, you know you have a hard time hearing me over it. But uh, but I don't know. I, I listen to all kinds of stuff depending on my mood. You know, I might listen to David Gray, or I might listen to to Coldplay, or I might be listening to something like that, or I might go over into classical if I feel like it, or Inya or something. It just depends on my mood. Again, how am I feeling that day? What kind of painting am I doing? Am I am I if I'm doing a lay-in in a background? And I'm laying in a beginning stage of a painting. I can listen to some pretty aggressive music because there's nothing really that particular happening. It's more scrubbing and scraping and, um, you know, things like that. But but if I'm if I'm working on the finesse face and I'm going into laying the eyes, I don't think I want corn or or you know tool on or something. You know, I'm probably going to want to put on, you know, Vivaldi or Mozart or something and and really chill out and really relax and and let that guide me through the painting. So. It really has to do with and what mood I'm in, uh, what music I adopt uh, for that situation, you know. So again, we're you know we're coming down to 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 the end here. I think we'll probably. Um, I'll probably write it right out. Might as well. I've mean, got 20 minutes left. So we'll take a little break here in a minute. Um, I think we have... Go ahead and break. So we're going to take a break right now. Um, and, and I'm going to, uh, you know, take about a five, six minute break. And then we'll come back for a short 15, 20 minute and finish this thing up. But it's really quite finished already. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're more or less right there. Um, with it. So let me uh, maybe look at some questions you have while I'm sitting here. My eyeballs are starting to go, so I mean, I'm going to you need to get glasses here pretty soon, I think. Uh, do I listen to modern interpretations of classical? I don't know. Um, again, I'm, uh, when it comes to how I'm way more astute with painting than I am music, uh, although I have a good ear, I think, and I like lots of different kinds of music, I don't, I'm not as particular about uh, music as I am about my painting. Um, so, um, again, if it resonates with me and I like it, um, lyrics don't seem to bug me when I paint. So I have a tendency just to, um, you know, paint regardless, you know. I mean, it doesn't matter. Again, like I could paint with probably a pretty, you know, some classic rock on or something and it wouldn't bug me, really, you know. So, um, people talk about color and value a lot, but chroma not as much. Are there any hard and fast rules regarding chroma? Chroma, you know, chromatically, most of the paintings I like happen to be pretty dull. They're not ridiculously bright paintings. Um, I find those to be kind of kitsch and a little bit, um, they, they can be. Uh, there are people that can, can reel that, people like John Asaro, who's a good friend of mine, uh, and just a friend, one of the best contemporary colorists I probably know. Um, and, and there's other guys like um, um, God, I can't, uh, Stephen Asal and people like that that are, you know, pushing the boundaries of color. I, I like to get in there and mix it up too with color and, and, and push the boundaries a little bit. But, uh, but I, I also like guys like Jeremy Lipkin and, and I like those guys that are really more monochrome painters. You know, they don't paint that colorfully. Uh, let me see, Raphael's asking, Jeff, I know that you have a sports background training and you transmit it through your art. What would you advise people that try to study by themselves? Is it good to set a schedule, etc.? Um, yeah, Raphael, that's one thing I'll be touching on. Probably the, one of the first or second podcasts I do in a couple weeks from now will be about setting up a training regimen for yourself and what that looks like and what uh, I've found over the years is, is, has helped me. Um, but yes, you absolutely need a schedule of some sort. Uh, Short-term, mid-term, long-term goals, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly five year, 10 year, 20 year, um, you need to then implement a very strong structured program with which to see those through. That's an art in and of itself. There's lots of little books I will bring up as well when I cover that. And um, so that's something to look forward to. I will also be creating curriculums on the online school as the online school becomes more um, polished out. We will start to direct people like if you want to be a concept or you want to be a background painter, you want to be a work in the gaming industry, you want to be a fine art painter, a portrait painter, a landscape painter. We'll set up um, ratios of classes that I think would be very beneficial for people to, uh, to follow through with. So we'll begin to that soon enough, uh, but good question. Not an easy one to answer quickly. Totally agree, as a photographer, sometimes, da -da -da -da. okay, here's a question I find really interesting. 
when and how do you know when something is finished, especially with life drawing or painting? That's, they always say it takes two people to do a painting, one to do the painting and one to take the brush away when it's done. Artists have a very difficult time knowing when to quit. And I'm no different. Um, usually you're done when you've said what you had to say. And sometimes a class that has a definitive time limit on it can be very helpful to, um, to encouraging you to learn how to do that. Um, so sometimes we need deadlines for sure. And we need to set deadlines for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll just work the thing right into the ground if we are given the, uh, the ability to do that. I find really interesting. Okay, um, uh, would I touch a painting up afterwards in the studio? Sometimes. I've got really good recall, and I know what looks weird on a painting. And if I don't have a vest, I mean, if the painting, you know, is something that I'm not like, you know, it's not going anywhere. Maybe it's not going to a show. Maybe it's just an exercise. Yeah, I'll go home and go for it and see what happens. See if I can use some of my imagination to figure out what I can do with it. And if it, if I if it goes south, I just scrub it, and I have a nice stained canvas for the next effort. So anyway, yeah, good questions, you guys. Very, very, very good. Very, very nice. Uh, good to get to kind of interact with you a little bit, a little bit more. Um, some of you who I've seen again, like I said online, but you know, again, I'm so busy filming and, and doing all this stuff and teaching and painting, and that it's hard for me to get on and interact as much as I would like sometimes. So this is another way for me to give back to you guys and be able to kind of you know talk to some of you, uh, you know, in in kind of real time, almost like we're skyping, or, you know. So, but yeah, it's all good, good stuff. Okay, let's see. Uh, we've got, I'll just set it for, let's see, it's clear. About 20 minutes. You're doing great, by the way. Yeah, thank you so much for being patient with me. Okay, so it's going. <laughs> okay, you're, okay, so. Yeah, it's looking good. Okay. So now, again, I'm going in and just doing some finesse. It's going to be down to blending little edges. There's no big major things that need to be done. Um, nothing that really could be done that's major. So thank God I don't have anything like that at this point. But I have found, found myself at this point in a class where I'll take out an eye and put it in again or something or try to because I just, I'm so frustrated with it not quite looking the way I want it to. So I'll just throw caution to the wind. After all, it is a study and I'll just go for it. But that's not the case tonight, but sometimes it does happen. It happens to the best of people, so. Um, life painting will always keep you on your toes. It's, it's a very honest thing to do. It's very addicting because of its honesty. It's where the rubber meets the road, really. I mean, there's nothing to hide behind. It's just you, mano e mano. I mean, it's like, it's like being an actor, like an actual uh, actor on Broadway or something, rather than a, a, an actor that works in film where you're you know, not, you know, you're actually getting the interaction immediately with the crowd, and if you mess up, I mean, you're messing up in front of everybody. It's not like you can retake it and do another retake and another retake. And so those are, you know, in, in, in the world of acting, you know, you're, those are the people that are going to be most respected, probably. I mean, really. Uh, maybe they don't make as much money, maybe they're not as famous, but man, they're, they're the real thespians, you know, the real, real deal. And a lot of the best actors, whether it's Anthony Hopkins or something like that, come out of that kind of background of, of, uh, of training, just like some of the best uh, concept artists, visual development guys come out of fine art, come out of illustration, come out of uh, you know, traditional mediums, and then turn to digital and become superstars in the digital arena. But they're coming in with just an incredible amount of knowledge and ability that they've acquired from years of, of technical, hard painting, hard problem solving, not that it, digital isn't hard, but it has different parameters. And the ability to cheat, change, alter, manipulate, and to not be totally, um, respon I wouldn't say responsible, but totally, you can undo anything at a, at, with a press of a button. You can't do that in painting. There are certain things that cannot be undone, at least not easily. So you end up finding yourself having to be a little bit more careful, a little bit more um, patient, a little bit more insightful in some ways. And that's gonna lend itself to better problem solving, better design sense, better control. And then when you get a medium like that's very forgiving, like digital or gouache or something, you're able to just take it and run with it and do incredibly good stuff fairly quickly. 
So again, that's an area that many of you will have to delve into because if you're going into concept and you're going into visual development, you're going to need to know digital. You're going to need to be really good at it. But I would highly encourage you to work on your traditional skills first because they're harder to acquire. And once you go to digital, it's going to be hard to go back the other way and try to learn traditional because it just has a different learning curve. Uh, so you may find yourself incredibly frustrated and... and, and um, you know, but it, you know, I understand if you had to go to digital because you, you know, you didn't, couldn't find a school at the time, and there are a lot of tutorials online. And digital is a little bit easier to teach and learn, so you're going to see more good tutorials and good schools um, that can teach basic digital. But you're not going to find as many that can teach good painting, good drawing, uh, good comp old school composition, old school techniques. Those are going to be fewer and far between. They're coming back, but they're still rare. So um, that was my goal to bring it to everybody. In a, in a more grandiose fashion to reach more people from other parts of the world with what, we, what, what I've spent my whole life trying to learn how to do. And I'm by no means a definitive um, source of anything. I'm just a little bit further ahead than some of you and could probably help get you to where you want to go a little more efficiently. But I have endless things to learn myself. So I am by no means coming from the standpoint that I have it all figured out. I just have spent most of my time trying to figure stuff out like that. So. I've, I've learned lots about how to do that. And uh, if I can share that with some of you guys and make your job or your, your, uh, your, your journey a little bit easier, then that's really cool. You know, that's a, that's a good thing. Okay, so let's see, where are we at? Any more questions coming through? Boy, Jim, you're really keeping me on my toes here tonight. Um, you are generally always mixing, are you ge generally always mixing in the Riley manner, even with regards to an open palette? For instance, are you simply tempering local colors with the light color, in the case of a yellowish hue? Um, you know, I'm always thinking in terms of harmonizing through value and edge. Color being the wild card. Color is, I quite frankly do not think that much about color. And I know that sounds probably really weird to you guys. Um, I, I'm really more concerned about the shapes, the mosaic of the brushwork as it glues together, the edges that are being created, the intentional aspect of creating good edges, good values, and being very vigilant in that area. And the color then comes last. And so I'll look at the overall painting, I'll look at the model and say, yeah, it's a little bit lighter than her skin tone on the right side than it probably is up there. But I like the way it looks in my painting. Do I change it just because I see it a little differently? Or if I like what I did even more than what I see, do I trust what I like and go with that? I will trust what I like because it's my painting and it's my vision and it's my statement to, to make. So I'm going to, um, to always filter everything through that and then respect the concepts that I've learned academically, but not be completely reliant on them or uh, dogmatic or, or even, um, you know, I hate to, yeah, I don't want to be reliant or, yeah, I hate to say I don't want to be a slave to that, but I don't want to be confined to having to follow something because I think I'm supposed to. I'm going to try to trust my instincts. So I work a lot from, from my, my intuition and my instincts, but you have to earn that through proper training. Um, that's not something that you acquire just naturally or, or you know, some people have a, a more a propensity towards intuition, but um, that's not always the case. I mean, it has to be acquired through, I think, diligent practice and learning. Um, Concept and visual development are fun, but one needs fundamentals. Uh, you got it. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, yeah, concepting and value and visual development are basically the byproducts of working at the highest level of your academic uh, areas because you're inventing, manipulating, and creating out of nothing. And so it is one of the hardest, most unbelievably cool areas to work in, and I've done a lot of visual development, a lot of people don't know that, that my, my, I started with doing heavy metal covers and um, working in uh, comics and, you know, and working in visual development, theme park concepting, storyboarding, movie posters, book covers, um, 
Yeah, just straight visual development for all kinds of companies. Um, yeah, I, I choose you name it. And um, what always saved me was my unbelievably good ability to draw, you know, and, and the concept uh, out of my ability to to pull something out of my head that was uh, committed to memory through practice. And that comes from foundational components being put in place, 100%. Yeah, someone's asking about the Twilight of Painting book. If I remember correctly about trends in art, it would be interesting to hear a future podcast about it. Yeah, that, that's, by, by all means, I will do that. Um, what I'll probably start doing for those podcasts is once every couple months, or I don't know how often, I'll probably do them once a month, but I'll pick my favorite book uh, or something, a book, one of my favorites, and I will kind of talk a little bit about what that book meant to me, what I, how I felt about it, how it changed my perceptions, what it contributed to, to me as an artist or a person. Because uh, remember, this process of becoming a good artist is the process of becoming a great person. And that means an insightful person, a compassionate person, a tenacious person, a, you know, all the things that you would, would be under great character. Character is something earned through adversity usually, not through skating by, having an easy road, having uh, everything given to you, being able to, you know, it's about earning it. It's about walking the talk. It's about digging deep. It's about fighting the good fight. It's all the things, all these cliches that people use to, to represent someone that's doing the right thing. And, and, and the right thing is always hard. It's never freaking easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So it takes a certain person. And those, some, a lot of times those people have to be formed through uh, other people, uh, through the guidance of other people, through um, whether directly or indirectly, through books, through um, learning, you know, through books, reading, um, studying with those people if possible, um, things like that. I mean, that's how each one of us propels ourselves forward on our journey, you know? I think. I mean, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, The Twilight of Pain, though, that's a cool book. I think it's out of print. I'm almost positive. You can find it online, I'm sure. But it's a very poignant observation about the dilapidation of the Atelier systems and the systems that were put in place over hundreds of years, you know, and um, and it really paints a very, very um, straight picture of what happened, but it, it didn't have a great outlook for the future, and I'm happy to say that I think he missed the mark on that one, because what I see happening now with schools like ours and other schools like Jacob Collins and um, in Caminetti and all these other places and Juliet Aristides and all these people that are, are taking some initiative. Yes, some of us are young and some of us are probably too young to be fully carrying the torch, but someone's got to do it and you got to jump in there and make it happen. I mean, you can sit and whine about it and complain about it or you can do something about it. And for me, it was always like, you know, I didn't really want to start a school. I didn't set out to start a school. I, I created a school so I could train some people to know the things that I knew so that I could have some friends to interact with that knew what I knew. So that would be, it's not so lonely, right? Because when I was learning this stuff, it was few and far between that you could find anybody that was even teaching. I got really, really lucky. Um, and it changed my whole life. And, and um, when you find something that makes that, that big of an impact on you, some people will find that they want to share it. Some people will find they want to hoard it. Some people find, it, you know, depending on your personality and who you are, you're going to be either a taker or a giver. You know, if you oh God, I got this great technique that nobody else knows. Now I can go out and I can make more money than anybody else and I can succeed more than anybody else and nobody else is going to know it and I know it and I'm the only one that knows it. Well, man, that's a pretty f lame way to look at things, but there are a lot of people that do. And then there's other people that say, oh, I got this wonderful thing and I want to share it with everybody and I want everybody to know it because it's so cool and it's going to make so much difference and everybody's and it's going to help. You know, I mean, there's other people that have that mentality. So you just want to find the people that have that later mentality if you can because those are the ones that are going to get you good those are the ones that are going to want to get you good and that's 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 what it's all about it, and you know yeah i could sit in my room and i could 20 years ago when i learned this stuff i could have really just gone off and become very successful fine art painter and and, and didn't really share much of it and um got that you know i don't know there's a lot of things i could have done differently but i'm glad i didn't 
you know, I'm, I'm glad I did not do that. But uh, but I know people that did, and I know people that should have passed this stuff on, but are too, you know, just didn't do it, won't do it, for whatever reasons. And again, that's something they'll have to address with themselves, not me. I, you know, I could stop teaching tomorrow, and I would have given back way more than I ever had ever thought I would, and I would be fine with it, and I could move on without having any feeling of remorse or guilt or that I didn't uh, help. Uh, push forward this technique and try to keep it alive. Um, you know, Fred was, was, did so much good for everybody by passing this on to a younger generation that could then um, pass it on, you know, and continue to keep it alive. And so we owe him a, a huge debt uh, for what he did. You know, that was uh, a real stand-up thing to do. It was really awesome. So. I'll always be indebted to that, that those guys, you know, Greg, Glenn Orbick and uh, Mark and, and uh, Fred and, and all, the, all, the, all the people that helped me become a good painter, an artist, and, and, and allowed me to kind of springboard off of it and, and then move on to help share it with other people. So it's cool. It's really good stuff. Okay, so we've got about a couple minutes left. I'll just, I, I, there's not a lot left to do on this painting as far as a study, so I'll answer some questions here as we wrap it up. You can go ahead and take a break. You're good. So let me turn this thing up. Okay, so what do we got here? It says, I got, um, I remember you talking about, okay, uh, do, yes, do you meter your models and then check the his, do, uh, color, temperature, etc.? Uh, no, I, I don't do anything that, that um, careful. <laughs> Most of my judgments are based on observation, intuition, cross-referencing with concepts that I've I've read from people like Richard Schmidt from his book, All Prima, best book probably on painting, one of them, top five, easily. Um, uh, those kind of things. So um, you're welcome, Adrian, no worries. Um, someone was just thanking me for the online school, which I, I think, yeah, no worries. It's my pleasure. Um, let's see, I just need to mention that we don't see the model for real, but she is really gorgeous. Yeah, she's beautiful. Um, Color temperature from your lighting in the studio is critical. Your guidance to transition to warmer or cooler palettes was truly fascinating. Okay. Um, color temperature from your lighting in the studio is critical. Your guidance to transition to warmer or cooler palettes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, again, uh, going from, you'll, you'll run the extreme from someone like Richard Schmidt, who is incredibly particular about his lighting situation in his studio to guys like Frazetta who would work under anything. The guy would, uh, when I saw his studio, it, it was hilarious how um, poorly put together, well, it just wasn't what you would think, right? It's, it's a corner of a room with a fluorescent light, cold fluorescent light with whatever. I mean, the guy could paint anything under any situation. So. When you're that genius, yeah, it helps a little bit, obviously. But but he was not. You know, some painters are going to be very particular about their everything, and other ones aren't going to be. So you'll just have to determine kind of what kind of painter you are, and and work with that um, kind of wiring. You know, still curious about north facing studio, east west supple lighting. You know, again, north light studios are are desirable because the light is so even and so consistent throughout the day that uh, you don't have a lot of fluctuations in temperature. And for a painter that likes to control the you know the nuances on their paintings that's going to be very uh, a very positive thing for them do you follow Fibonacci composition um, composition for me again is is a um, I studied a lot of it through working at guys like Dean Cornwell and um, Repin and all the great composers and doing thumbnail studies of their paintings and observing their paintings and going to see their paintings so I like to learn through practical means I don't really like personally to over-intellectualize the process of some of the things I do. Uh, that doesn't mean I go in half-cocked. It doesn't mean I don't study them. You know, I, I study, um, I have tons of books on composition. And composition is, to me, I wouldn't say it's a holy grail, but it's everything put into, everything goes into composition. Good figure, good drapery, good anatomy, good heads, um, good still life, good landscape. So you have to study every one of those areas as an art in and of themselves, and then bring them into narrative storytelling. But if any one of those areas is weak, you run the risk of of, um, uh, of compositions not working, not holding together. Any one of those areas could break a composition. So composition is a lot common sense. 
it's a lot looking at other painters and using their uh, judgments. I mean, uh, there's so many, so much to talk about with composition. My dad's a phenomenal composer. I mean, one of the really phenomenal old school composer. So he's going to be laying down a lot of compositional classes online that I think will be incredibly enlightening to all of you. Um, I know I'll be taking them. <laughs> so, um, but they're fantastic. But no, I, I don't. I don't follow like Golden Mean as much, or I understand it, um, but I don't. I'm not hyper obsessive about it. You know, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but a lot of it can come down to practical as well. I know so you guys are seeing probably just a glimpse of my nose, which is quite funny. I'm looking at it as I'm talking to you. Um, yeah, that's a good. That's a good thing. You know, paint the picture. Don't let the picture paint you. I mean, definitely. Strong opinions about composition. Composition is like anything. It's like um, your color taste, your food taste. It's so many good ways to look at it. But uh, I think use the uh, past masters to guide you. Yeah, Sebastian, good to have you on board. No worries. Yeah, you're going to love it. Uh, we're going to have... Um, another thing we're going to have coming up, you guys, is these skill competitions online where each month... I'll give away a drawing of mine, and um, we'll, we'll look at it from the standpoint of who's improved the most, not necessarily who's doing the greatest individual piece, but the, the improvement that's occurred. And they're going to be a skill, um, like sprints, kind of, that you guys will do, and we'll set them up each week. And that's starting, I believe, right now. So uh, Tom's working on it with me, and uh, we're just now starting that. So look forward to that. In two weeks, we'll be doing another one of these. I'm not sure whether it'll be a drawing or a painting yet. kind of depends. Um, I'll start having some of the other guys come in and do some uh, demos for you as well, so it won't always be me. But, uh, but thank you for tuning in, and uh, I really enjoyed doing it, so I'll, I'll do more of it in the future. So keep pushing play, you guys. Have fun, and don't lose your passion for the craft. Uh, it's really the key to, to, uh, to your future success as professional painters, or just really high-end um, painters for your own um, betterment, which I think is the most, the most wonderful reason to be doing it. Cool. All right, you guys. I'm tuning out. Take care. Okay. Oh, really? Oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah. That's that's funny. I did. I saw that, and I was like, "Isn't that you?" Yeah. Okay. Let me see. How do I do that? Um, like, like confusing me. Can I take a picture of it? Sure, sure. Okay. Feel free. Awesome. And then I'll get you your check and everything's good and